Morning, everybody. Ian Doyle is my name. I work for the Heritage Council. Um, I'm not going to say too much more. I'm going to hand you over to Benuna May, who is a Heritage Council board member, to give a welcome. And then that will be followed by, um, we're delighted to have Minister of State Malcolm Noonan, TD, here to give a welcome and say a few words on behalf of the department as well. So over to you, Fanula, please. Do you have a gorgeous Glean for Washa Do you have Good morning, everyone. You're uh, very welcome to this information uh, webinar on the webinar on the Historic Towns I Initiative. And um, this is a wonderful uh, collaborative project between ourselves in the Heritage Council and the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, and of course, local authorities throughout the country. And the purpose, I suppose, of, the, of this programme is to um, help communities to conserve, repurpose and, re and repair elements of um, the, the historic towns that we have throughout the, the country. And of course, um, as part of that, um, it's, it's a wide ranging thing, but also now includes um, the ability to bring buildings into uh, residential use, which of course is supported by many government policies, um, our Housing for All and Town Centre First policies. But um, the most, to me, the most important thing about this that this is as usual from the Heritage Council this is a flexible and practical scheme um, which is accessible to many types of projects and to many groups who would uh, want to uh, benefit from it. Um, today we're going to hear excellent uh, case studies from all around the country from Wexford to Donegal and um, that demonstrate the benefits and uh, the practicalities of, of the scheme. Um, the scheme is, is marvellous in that it does bring neglected qualities and associations in various towns to the fore and it engenders um, and um, capitalises on the community interest and the community pride that is there all around the country in, in, our, in our towns. Um, and given all of the policy and, and the talk that we've had in the country on this, it's now okay to think that Irish towns are great. Uh, we knew it uh, maybe in our, our sphere all along, but now it's being more generally recognised, which is, which is great. And it does engender ground up work by people in their own towns for their own towns. Um, and which, as we know, have the best chance of, uh, of longevity. Um, the fund is, uh, um, is a generous one. We have uh, two million in uh, uh, funding for the scheme this year. Um, and we are looking forward to applications that uh, will allow um, the, the uh, benefits of the scheme to continue into 2023 and to have successful projects. So again, I wish to welcome you on behalf of the, of the Heritage Council and hope that you um, gain a lot out of this uh, webinar to enable you to participate fully in the scheme. So thank you very much and I hope it will be a productive morning. I'll hand you back to Ian now. Thank you, Fanula. And just to hand over to Minister of State, Malcolm Noonan, TD now. For Magatin, I was the for Marginals, Falsha, Lagakenia. I say a Thai Tunsknov, Nepal to Starula, no Knohus, Comparatok, the Quid Narinta, Tahiokta, Rilta Sautu, Lagas Irokta, Agus on Korla, Arokta, Kurinshe, Autunant, Atafi Stur, Hirokta, Ibalcha, Starula, Kun Quin. Good morning, everyone, and you're all very welcome to this uh, important uh, webinar. The Historic Towns Initiative is a joint undertaking between the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and the Heritage Council. <clears throat> this promotes the heritage-led regeneration of our historic towns. The Heritage Council is now accepting applications from local authorities across the country for the Historic Towns Initiative 2023. Our department has allocated €2 million Euro to the Heritage Council for <laughs> this fund. Last year, 1.5 million euro in funding was awarded under the scheme, providing local employment, supporting traditional skills and economic stimulus. Since 2018, a total of 27 towns such as Sligo, Letterkenny, Callan and Listowel have benefited from the scheme with a variety of innovative projects funded. These include streetscape conservation projects such as works to traditional railings, render and joinery, as well as historic roof maintenance and public realm works. Many of our city, town and village centres are historic places. Caring for these involves the conservation and reuse of existing buildings. 
The HCI relies on the strength of local communities and businesses to regenerate their historic town, supported by local and national government and other agencies committed to improving the quality of life of a town, as Finola has said. Local authority and heritage staff, whether it be heritage officers, conservation officers, engineers, or municipal area officials, are key players in the operation of programs like this, working on the ground with stakeholders, community groups, and property owners. And I would like to thank each and every one of you for the contribution that you make in this regard. As set out in my department's Housing for All policy, we are particularly interested in proposals that bring vacant or underused floor area in historic buildings back into residential use under the HTI. We want to encourage private owners and or occupiers to work with local authorities to carry out conservation networks to their payers and to bring vacant floor areas of historic buildings back into residential use. We see a huge potential in this as we try and tackle this, this uh, housing crisis. And I think there's heritage led regeneration has an important role to play in this regard. This year, the HCI will continue to provide support to towns in drafting heritage-led regeneration plans, which will inform future applications to the HDI for conservation works. Later on today, you'll be hearing about one such plan completed in 2022 in Wexford, which will be of great interest. You'll also hear about projects in Ballyshannon, Monaghan, McCroom, Tipperary and Kildare, which were all funded under the HDI in 2022. I am delighted that we'll also be hearing about the implementation of the Town Centre First programme from the LGMA National Project Manager, Mairead Hunt. The heritage and regeneration of our town centres and careful reuse of historic buildings, the conservation of key buildings and monuments all lead to places with a sense of place, character and time depth. These are essential qualities of towns which we want to thrive and we want to see them be vibrant into the future and an intent policy behind this, which we've launched in 2022. Just a quick reminder that uh, our Historic Structures Fund, our Built Heritage Investment Scheme, Community Monuments Fund um, applications uh, will be, the closing date for applications is coming up soon. I know there's huge interest in all of your local authorities in, the, in these funding streams as well. Very complementary funding schemes to what uh, we're talking about today. And I think combined the, what we are trying to achieve in government and with the support of the Heritage Council, is a, a much more coordinated approach to these funding streams, how they can interact and build capacity and build critical mass, particularly in our towns. And as I said, heritage-led regeneration should be part, front and centre of the solution to our housing crisis. We're also looking forward to a very exciting year for Heritage in Ireland with the continued implementation of Heritage Ireland 2030 with the development of the new National Biodiversity Action Plan and the rollout of biodiversity officers across the country, so and new national monuments legislation as well. So there's a lot happening in 2023, an exciting time for heritage, but I look forward to the presentations this morning. I'll be able to stay with you to up to the, the, the virtual tea break. And uh, again, I look forward to the deliberations and thank all involved in the Heritage Council for this really important workshop. Gormila Mahakwip Kalair. Kermila Margaret, Minister, we really appreciate those words and thank you, Fanula, as well. Um, just before we, we get started, uh, just a couple of quick housekeep, uh, housekeeping points, I suppose. Um, first is, this is a webinar, it's set to webinar, so not everybody who's here will be able to, uh, or we can't see everybody who's here, but um, it, it's just a different setting. Um, please use the chat. Um, if you have a question, um, we can see you if you put your hand up, but do please use the chat. Uh, sorry, we can't physically see you if you put your hand up, but you can put the, the little icon up um, um, and just put your comment into the, the chat box. We'll, we'll, we'll check on those. And then finally, we are recording this um, as a webinar and we will see, we did this last year, we had some questions on it already this year. There is interest in uploading these presentations for people who can't make it. Um, but we won't put anything up without consent and without checking with people. And obviously we will do some editing, but, but we'll be in touch with everybody about that. Um, so to, to get us started, and we are bang on time, um, our first paper, I'm delighted, as the Minister mentioned, that we have Mairead Hunt, who is the National Coordinator of the Town Centre First Office in the Local Government. <coughs> so if you want to 
you want to tr get your slides uploaded in Marie, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Yeah, uh, can everyone see uh, the slides okay? Yes. Yep, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and thanks to the Heritage Council, Council for inviting me here today. My name is Marie Hunt. I'm the National Town Centre First Coordinator, and I'm delighted to be here to talk about Town Centre First. So what is Town Centre First? Well, it's a policy that was launched by the government in February of 2022. It has cross-government uh, support and it really puts town centres at the heart of decision making going forward. But more importantly for me, it's actually an action plan. It sets out a very clear pathway as to how we're all going to work together to change the narrative of our Irish town centres. So to give some context, the Town Centre First policy is consistent with key government um, policies that have come before. And if you look at those policies, there is a thread of something like the Town Centre First running through them. And I suppose the Town Centre First policy is a combination of the momentum that has been building both nationally and locally to change the narrative of our, particularly our rural Irish Town Centres. But the reality is that there is no magic wand and no one size fits all solution. So the Town Centre First policy recognises this and for every location identified there will be a bespoke plan developed for that particular town or village and when I say Town Centre I'm talking about villages also. So we have over 500 towns in Ireland with a population of greater than 400 people. And Town Centre First applies to all those towns. It also applies to our cities, but the work of the National Town Centre First Office is really focused on towns and villages with a population between 400 people and 10,000 people. Those towns and villages all face similar uh, issues, challenges to a greater or lesser extent. So you're talking about building vacancy and dereliction, a real challenge um, since COVID particularly of the online shopping and the out of town shopping that has been on the increase. Also, there is a really low desire to live in town centres. We're all wet to our cars. We all want to park right outside our doors or outside whatever shop or business we're going into. There is also a perceived lack of access to green spaces. And of course, because our town centres are choked with traffic, there's the noise that goes with that. However, the national office um, has been set up for an initial period of three years. That's 1,095 days. I'm now just over 100 days into my appointment. So it's a big challenge um, and there's a lot of work to be done. But having said that, it's not all doom and gloom. There are huge opportunities. Um, and I think particularly with COVID, we learned the value of our town centres, the local businesses, the amenities on our doorstep. And it really made us stop and realise what we have um, without having to travel somewhere to actually get out and enjoy what we have locally. Also, COVID has taught us that pretty much any office-based job can be done from anywhere. You no longer need to commute five days a week to an urban centre to do your job. You can do that in your hometown, in your own locality, and spend that uh, time that you get back from not having to commute, you can spend it in your town centre with your family, enjoying what's on your doorstep. Just to... Uh, paint the picture of this photo that I have here, the before picture. This building, the white building there with fire castle uh, across the front, that was a vacant building. It had been vacant for about 15 years and this is in what was or is the market square in Kildare town, which is a heritage town. But like lots of market squares across our heritage towns, it had been taken over as a car park and it was choked with cars. That was just a sea of cars in front of that building. The Far Castle building was renovated and turned into an artisan bakery restaurant with accommodation overhead. 
and it opened just before the first COVID lockdown. In response to that, the local authority removed the car parking spaces, resurfaced the area, put in social distance markings, but not the bright yellow markings that we all grew to, to recognize in shops and other areas. They're very subtle, RAL gray markings, two meters apart. Then put in outdoor dining furniture and some planting that um, was upcycled agricultural troughs and the likes. That intervention by the local authority, and it was at a very low cost, actually meant that the Fire Castle business, which had opened just before the COVID lockdown, not only survived those lockdowns, and we, we had a fair few in Kildare over and above the national ones, but it thrived. It became a real focal point for the community. Uh, people could walk there. They, they weren't breaking their, their five kilometer um, uh, limit. And it allowed the community to put on events in the square, like an outdoor cinema. And actually I myself went down there one Saturday morning and did Tai Chi, standing on one of those markers um, and did Tai Chi with, with the community and it was absolutely wonderful. So that's an example of one of many around the country and that's the kind of opportunities that we have now. This intervention was a quick, low-key, tactical urbanism, but now Kildare County Council are developing plans to make that a permanent redevelopment of the market square and give it back to the people. So who are the key roles and players in the implementation of the Town Centre First policy? Well, the first uh, group that you see there is the National Oversight Advisory Group. That is a group that is made up of key national players and government departments who will um, have oversight and monitor the implementation of the Town Centre First policy. Under that then is the National Town Centre First Office. And at the moment that's just me, but I will be getting resources in February. So the role of the National Town Centre First Office is to coordinate the implementation of the Town Centre First policy nationally to ensure consistency, to gather the data into one central portal, um, the, the baseline data that will be gathered for each of our town and village centres, publish that out so as that government departments, local authorities, town generation officers and town teams can all see what the challenges are and maybe start to compare towns of similar population where something's working and you know that they could maybe learn from those towns or look at other challenges in other towns and how they've been addressed. The town regeneration officer um, will be appointed in each local, well 26 local authorities, the urban local authorities are not in this particular uh, program at the moment. 26 town regeneration officers will be appointed at a senior level in each local authority and that person will be dedicated to supporting the setup of town teams and to help and guide the town team in the development of a town centre first plan. They will also be the key liaison from between town teams and the local authority and will also be responsible for pursuing funding to develop and deliver the projects identified in town centre first plans in collaboration with town teams. Um, town teams then, and these are the, the really important group, town teams are local, passionate people who want to shape the future of their towns in a really positive way. They, each town team will be, have a different kind of makeup. It has to be representative of that particular town. So you will see representatives of uh, residents, community groups, uh, businesses, uh, sporting groups, the youth, the elderly, whatever is in that town. If there's a strong farming community, then that community should be uh, represented. If there's a big industry in the town, that should be represented on the town team. And the town team really are the ones who are going to drive the development of the town centre first plan because they know their, lo their locality, they know the issues, they know the opportunities. So it is very much a bottom up approach, but with a lot of support and assistance from the local authority through the town regeneration officer. So how do we do this? Well, as I mentioned, there will be 26 town regeneration officers appointed. 26 pilot locations have already been selected nationally. And there's government funding backing both of these things. So the 26 town regeneration officers are being funded by the Department of Community and Rural Development. 
for a period of three years, and that's an initial period. The 26 pilot locations will have their town centre first plans funded by DRCD also, and there will be a call for an additional 26 locations um, shortly, and then perhaps towards the end of 2023. So as capacity is building, momentum is building also, and it won't be one a year, it might be two or three a year going forward. So where are we right now 100 days in? Well, these are the 26 locations that have been selected. 14 town regeneration officers have been appointed to date, with the remaining 12 going through an open recruitment competition. 14 town centre first plans are well underway in their development and procurement is ongoing in, in relation to the remaining 12. The, these first 26 town centre first plans have to be complete by the end of June 2023. So the pressure is really on um, to get these plans up, running and, and developed. So what is a town centre first plan? Well, it's evidence-based first and foremost. The first step in developing a town centre first plan is to carry out a health check. And that health check is based on the Heritage Council's Collaborative Town Centre health check. Um, now there will be additional data over and above that gathered, but we haven't fully settled on what that additional data will be just yet. But so for the moment, it's a Heritage Council's model of health check. There will be consistent uh, methodology used by each local authority and town team in the development of the town centre first plan. So whilst each plan will be different because each town and village is unique, the methodology, the data, the type of data gathered will all be consistent, will all be mapped and will all be published back out for the community, local authorities, government departments to actually see and understand the towns and um, the challenges facing towns and villages. At the end of three year period, there will be a town centre impact assessment carried out for each of the locations and a cost benefit analysis. And that's really to see is town centre first working? Are there additional interventions or is there a tweak needed or uh, a change needed to the policy? But it will be kept constantly under review, but that cost benefit analysis will be done at the end of year three. So funding, and this is really important, and I suppose it, it relates to why we're here today. Um, going forward, there will be a 10 centre first focus on all major government funding. So we're talking about URDF, ORDF, Town and Village, and also the Historic Towns Initiative. It's really important that local authorities realise that the town centre first policy really is going to be the gateway for funding going forward. So if there's anything I want you to remember about the town centre first policy, it is, it is these five things. Town centre first has, is a government priority across all government departments. The policy recognises that every town and village is unique with unique set of challenges and opportunities. So a plan will be developed that will identify projects to address those challenges and also projects to leverage the opportunities that every town and village has and what makes that town or village unique. Partnership. So the Town Centre First policy is largely based on the Scottish model, but where the Irish model differs is that interwoven into the Town Centre First policy is a really key partnership between local authorities and community and town teams. And that's, that's the big difference, I guess, between the Irish and the Scottish model. Local authorities are now a really important player in addressing town, town, town centre challenges and grabbing the opportunities. But that has to be done in partnership with the local community in a bottom-up approach. Funding, as I've already mentioned, it is now, the government funding will now have a town centre first focus. And for me, the most important bit is the action piece. So I said at the beginning that there's no one size fits all or magic one solution, and there is not. But we are at nothing in developing a town centre first plan without the action that goes in developing and delivering the projects identified in those plans. 
So it is not enough to develop a plan. We have to go further. We have to actually make the projects identify the reality. And I guess that's where the solution is and that's where the magic will happen. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Mairead. Uh, that was really, really interesting and it's really important to set out that kind of broader context from a Heritage Council point of view. We really look forward to working with you on that and see how it develops. Um, now, I don't see any questions or chat, um, but if we, we give it time, we'll see what, what comes through. Um, can you stay with us for another while, Mairead? Brilliant, brilliant. Um, okay, we, we will have some questions. Sometimes it just takes a little while to get things bubbling up and moving along. Um, why don't we go to our next question, our next presentation. Actually, just before I do that, thank you so much for that, Mairead. I'm not sure if I said it already. Um, our next presentation, we're going to McCroom in County Cork, um, where we're going to hear about St. Coleman's Church and if I'm not mistaken, um, I think this project received ERDF funding and Cork County Council, Marion and Mary and Raymond may tell us about this. I think it echoes well from Mairead's comments about funding. What we've seen in some of the HTI projects is that the HTI money gets people started and it acts as a stepping stone then to larger funding applications. Um, so without further ado for me, I'm going to hand over to Mary O'Leary and Raymond Higgins of Cork County Council to tell us about St. Coleman's Church in McCroom, County Cork. Good morning. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I, my name is Marie O'Leary. I work in um, McCroom Municipal District uh, with Cork County Council, and I work with Raymond Higgins, who's our senior executive architect, who was project managing this project. So Ray is going to present some slides, and I can speak to you on um, the application process, or if anyone has any questions on uh, how the whole, um, you know, application uh, evolved. Um, I suppose it, as as you know, it's an online process. So it was my first time doing an online application. So it it all worked very well. Um, there was great input. Or if I had any questions from Ian Doyle or Amanda there in the Heritage Council, so it worked out well. I let Ray go through the detail of the project, and I can pop in and out as 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 need be. So I'll hand you over to Raymond, who'll talk to you through uh, the actual work that was con was done on the project. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Um, can everybody hear me and see the slides? We can. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Raymond. Perfect. OK, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to you uh, this morning about St. Coleman's Church in McCroom. It's the former Church of Ireland, and we carried out some emergency uh, conservation works as part of the 2022 Historic Towns Initiative. Um, a, building uh, sits in a very prominent town centre site. Um, it's enclosed graveyard and located on the western end of the town centre um, alongside the river and across from McCroom Castle. Uh, the building was built in 1835. It was designed by George Payne and it's a protected structure, uh, notably uh, very important for its architectural, artistic, historical and social value. Uh, the building has had a number of changes over the years, um, but really has fallen into um, unuse and dereliction since the early 90s. Um, when we started looking at this project, we realised that we needed to carry out some emergency conservation works, and that was really to tackle the maintenance and safeguard the building uh, in, for its future. Uh, we noted that we needed to repoint a lot of the stonework, we needed to carry out roof repairs, protection of the stained glass windows, especially on this raised elevation site that we're getting a lot of damage from the storms. Uh, we needed to repair the uh, external envelope in a lot of areas and the vegetation needs to be removed, which is causing all kinds of problems. And the rainwater goods needed to be repaired. And there was an awful lot of um, unsympathetic uh, repairs over the years. So we're using something like cement rather than lime, which is the natural material. So we wanted to try and eradicate the, the, the historic use of cement. So our timeline, as Marie said, we, we submitted the application last January and it was a very positive and easy application to put in. 
Um, and the turnaround was quite quick. We got our approval uh, at the end of February and that allowed us to quickly mobilise. And the first thing we did was we needed to appoint a specialist conservation team to support us. We're lucky that we have a lot of expertise in-house um, and specialists in, in, in conservation and QS and architectural team, but we needed to make sure that we got the right expertise for the works that we wanted to do. So we did appoint a conservation grade one architect. Uh, we also appointed a specialist engineer with conservation expertise, especially around the structural uh, repairs that were needed for the tower. And we also appointed the archaeologist uh, because of the, the setting of the building in the graveyard. We wanted to make sure that we were doing the things right and it was appropriate and making sure that we followed the correct procedures. We then prepared the design documentation and the tender documents and we advertised uh, for a qualitative uh, price uh, tender and that went out at the end of April, early May. And then we went through the tender process with a tender recommendation at the end of June. Uh, we appointed our specialist con conservation contractor in early July and they mobilised and really got going after the builders holidays in August where we commenced work and then we completed the project at the end of October. So it was all done in a fairly short uh, space of time but it needed to be kind of regimented and managed correctly. We were very lucky, uh, we secured 215, over 215,000 in Heritage Council funding as part of the T Historic Towns Initiative and then we were able to match fund 20% more to kind of allow the project to fully uh, do what we needed to, to, to happen. So once we started, uh, we uh, got the scaffolding uh, erected and that really allowed us to kind of get up to the very kind of top of the building, which we really had been kind of you know, estimating what was the real damage. So once we got up, we were able to see what, what needs to be done and we needed to check what we had originally designed for and make sure any changes or, or additions or any swaps in relation to the specifications. Once we, we, we did that, we were able to see the real condition of the tower and that's a kind of lack of, you know, maintenance and lack of res respect to the building over the years had allowed all kinds of damage to happen. We had vegetation, trees growing, stone had moved, cracked, places that some of the stonework had become displaced and we started to really look at the tower itself and discovered that there was a, a kind of a stepped lead uh, kind of concrete slab that was forming the, the roof. Um, there was the parapets were rendered but they were rendered in a cement render and that was causing all kinds of problems in terms of water and the hoppers uh, weren't really working and the downpipes were non-existent so that, that means that the rainwater was all just creeping into the building and with water coming inside you, you know the consequences of what that can cause. Uh, so we started to carefully conserve the tower, uh, we started to remove the cement uh, render, uh, we repaired the stonework, uh, we cleaned the lead gutters but we or the lead roof but we realised that for this building to kind of have a future the existing roof design wasn't really adequate. Um, the, the, having the water kind of come out through a single hopper was going to cause all types of maintenance problems in the future. So our design team and the, the project team, we came up with a solution to have a second roof at a higher level. And this was going to allow us to kind of get the water off the roof immediately. And it would lessen the need for kind of full on maintenance every year. Um, so we built a secondary roof a little bit higher than the one that was already there. Uh, we put down a new deck, uh, timber deck, and we put our new roof finish on top. We ventilated it to make sure that it wasn't going to cause any kinds of problems in the future. And now the water was going to come straight off the building and it wasn't going to be collected. Um, so once we got off the top of the tower, uh, we, this is a finished kind of image of how the water is coming out um, between the, the kind of stonework. Um, once we started going down the tower, uh, you can start to see some of the real problems that, that was occurring. Um, that vegetation that I spoke about, it really had uh, started to cause all kinds of problems. Uh, trees were beginning to move stones, stones had come off the building um, and we really needed to, to kind of remove stones, get rid of all the roots, treat the, the, the kind of actual building uh, structs fabric and then make sure that the stones were put back into place. Um, we used a lot of the stones that we had salvaged for stone indent repairs. And uh, we made sure that we were uh, kind of keeping the, the character of the building as we came through. Um, our, working our way down, we uh, repointed all the stonework. Uh, we used a lime uh, based uh, kind of mortar 
Um, and uh, we had a very specialist team that were able to, to kind of work really well to get that done. Um, we also uh, steam cleaned uh, the stonework. Uh, we used a low pressure, high temperature uh, clean on it. And that was going to remove all the pollution that would have been attacking the stonework over the years and really bring the building back to a new life, really. Uh, the material is, 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 has a huge lifespan. So by, by doing that, you're actually just bringing it and bringing it another lease of life. These are some of the finished images of the tower as the scaffolding starts to come down. You can really see the difference that this project has made. Um, it has really transformed uh, that element of the building. Um, and we worked right down to the ground level uh, carefully as the scaffolding was coming out, we, we finished it. Um, and these are some of the uh, kind of final images, just so you can see the scale of the changes and transformation. Not only that, we were able to start tackling some other areas of the building as well. We looked at the entrances, there's two entrances to the building um, and the steps and the stonework around them entrances again uh, were in a fairly poor condition um, and carefully using conservation approaches, we were able to uh, transform these and repair them uh, and bring them back. Um, this is the front entrance and this is the side entrance. And in some cases we removed the stone temporarily, we rebalanced them and we got them back into place to make sure that it was all level and it was all safe and it was all appropriate. In the uh, extension at the rear of the, the, the church, uh, the, the curved uh, element of the building had a lot of problems and all the rainwater goods needed to be replaced really. Uh, fundamentally, it's about collecting the water and getting it away from the building. And in this case, none of them was working. So the water was just seeping through the walls. So quite simply, uh, getting the rainwater goods correct would make a huge difference to any building. Um, so in this case, we had some slip slates uh, the ridge capping had moved and the curved uh, cast iron gutter needed to be fully replaced. So because it was bespoke, we needed to measure uh, the uh, actual gutter and we got that prefabricated off site. Uh, we created a brand new uh, kind of uh, barge fascia and uh, we prepared that while the gutter was being fabricated. And then we installed the new uh, curved cast iron gutter uh, with all the slates back in place, reused existing slates. Um, on that facade as well, there was a cement rendered gable, uh, kind of rendered to that gable. And that again was causing all sorts of problems. When you put a cement based render on an existing open wall like this, it's, it's not breathing. Uh, so the moisture is trapping in the wall fabric. So by removing that cement render, repairing the stonework and putting a more appropriate uh, lime render, that, that facade and that gable now is able to breathe and it's uh, waterproof with the, with the render that we put on. Um, and that's a finished image of what the, the rendered, uh, new rendered gable looks like. And then in other places, we just did a full kind of uh, spot check of where slates were slipped, we put them back where there was um, some ridge cappings here, you can see over the front porch, the lead had just completely full away, water was pouring straight into the building. Uh, and when we got up closer, we realized that lead really wasn't appropriate. It needed a slate um, ridge cap um, or a new ridge cap put onto it. Um, so we, we, we appropriately found one and put one on and made sure that the roof was fully secure in that way. And then we also have the louvers at the tower. Now, we weren't able to fully replace these as part of the project, but we needed to do some temporary kind of works to it to make sure that we could secure them um, and more importantly, stop any vermin like birds getting into the building because they again cause all types of damage internally. Uh, so we secured and added mesh and fixed the plywood sheets around the, the louvers to make sure that the building was secure until we got to the next phase of works. And again, with the stained glass windows, there's some beautiful windows in this building. Um, and again, over the years of, of kind of left abandoned, the building has suffered and we've lost uh, some of the glass, but we, we recorded all them. Uh, we got a full kind of survey done on the stained glass windows. And then we secured them, making sure that the vent, that air could circulate, but also uh, making sure that they were protected. Um, we did have a very successful heritage event um, and uh, under Heritage Week, uh, we invited uh, all the local um, residents and people that were interested in the building to uh, come to site uh, and our team uh, put on a, a series of talks and demonstrations to educate people um, about the building, about conservation works, about the traditional approaches. Uh, we did live demonstration on repointing. We showed how we mix the mortar. Uh, we talked about working in sensitive environments like graveyards, and we gave a little bit of knowledge to everybody about, uh, you know, 
what, what we should be doing to our buildings in our town centres. Um, it was really, really easy, really simple, but it was really successful. And, and sometimes it's, it's you know, having the opportunity just to engage and talk about what you're actually doing goes down really well locally. Um, I suppose this project is, was, was a real success for us. Um, it, it's, it's really good to see that it came in on time and, and on budget. And that really comes down to making sure you get the right team assembled uh, with the appropriate experience to conduct the works. Um, we knew that that in the time frame that you have to, to kind of carry out the works, it was important that we got the right people in. Um, so while we had a really experienced team internally, getting the grade one conservation architect from Ushin Craig at Design Forum, Ray Keenan Associates and Dan Noon, and they were able to kind of support us and make sure that we were able to uh, kind of deliver the right uh, specifications and design on the time that we needed it. And we wouldn't have been able to do this really without Queenstown Restoration, which was a fantastic conservation contractor. And they really uh, knew what they were doing and they worked with us every step of the way to make sure that we did the best we could for what we had on offer in terms of the project. These are some of the, the, the finished pictures. And I suppose uh, when you look at the tower now, uh, what we've been able to do is being able to remove any water ingress into the building. So that building now um, has allowed us to stabilize it and it's allowed us to start planning for its future. And we have a future now. Uh, we've started to come up with ideas. We've got a new part eight in place. Um, we've incorporated new universal access into the building and we're going to create a flexible community space for the town of Macroom. Uh, we've come up with a design to reconfigure the design, the ground floor. We'll have accessible toilets, we'll have stairs and an annex that will bring us up to a kind of a, a tea station. Um, and we will use the tower and we will make it a viewing platform to connect with the town and to bring people into the building and, and show that what they look at as a prominent building in the town can now be accessed and they can look out at the town. Um, and these are some of the interior images of what the building looks like internally. It's quite a lovely space. And then with some works that we will carry out, what it can look like. Uh, as Ian said, we have secured uh, RRDF funding late in 2022. Uh, so this is going to allow us, as part of a wider Macroom project, it incorporates all parts of Macroom, we will be able to uh, make this project really come to life and people will be able to use this building again and it will be brought back. Uh, to use, which is fantastic. These are some of the views from the tower, so you can see the connection uh, this building will have when people are able to access it safely once again. And that's it really. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions for myself or Marie, we're happy to, to answer. Thank you, Maraid, and thank you, Marie. Now, um, I, I have to apologize because I put you on the spot, Marie, and I put you on the spot, Raymond. I jumped over Monaghan, so apologies to Monaghan as well. Um, I just missed it on the programme, but I, I know Shirley and Moira are, are there and ready to go. Um, but just before before that, um, thank you for that presentation on Macron. Um, I don't see any questions, but we'll see what comes in. Um, I think it's great to see the way the HDI funding secured the building and gave you a breathing space and secured it. And we really look forward to see how the, the building develops with the assistance of the RRDF funding. It sounds like you have a, a lovely project there that will make a huge contribution to McCroom, which is a, a fine a fine town, and which we know will kick on pretty well since the bypass opened as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thanks for that. And apologies again for putting you on the spot 20 minutes early. Um, so now we're finally going to hand over to Moira and Shirley to tell us about their project in Dublin Street, Monaghan. Good morning. Uh, can everybody see that presentation? Can. Yes, we can, can, Moira. Yes. Can you move to presenter view, Moira? Yeah, I'm just trying to do that now. Yeah, I have yeah, it now. That's, that's it. Okay. Good to go. okay, thanks very much, Ian, for the invitation. Um, just I suppose to start with, um, yeah, our project was funded uh, for re-establishing residential use in the historic Dublin Street of Monaghan. And uh, just outline of the presentation, the rationale for the project, how we selected the properties, 
uh, two elements there was facade enhancements and internal works and then just to go through some of the issues and learnings and the project has been funded over two years uh, to allow for project development and to address regulatory uh, issues and to carry out works. Um, just in terms of both the historic context, to give a bit of background, you know, um, Monaghan doesn't have, a, I suppose, a typical large main street. So it's a number of main streets that radiate from the central diamond space, and uh, which includes Dublin Street, which leads to Old Cross Square. You know, there's a number of other, um, you can see point on the screen there, the diamond down to Dublin Street and Old Cross Square then at the, the bottom of it. Uh, and with the likes of Glasslock Street and the likes of Market Street radiating, and then you have a number of other key uh, urban spaces, Church Square, and you could have the Market Square also. And I suppose uh, Dublin Street itself, it's uh, was typically terraces of uh, three-storey structures, uh, generally two to three bay widths and interspersed with laneways through archways and with long rear annexes that extend into the depth of the plots there. And Dublin Street, um, I suppose just to give a background to the street itself, it has a good strong architectural identity and fine built heritage. Uh, once bustling uh, with small shop units to the front and long back gardens, which would have been tried in places of employment and leisure. But that has transitioned to demonstrate high levels of vacancy and redundant backlands. Uh, through the Heritage Council Collaborative Town Centre Health Check Programme, we've carried out land use surveys of the town centre and just the, some of the stats there, the ground floor survey with 53 properties, 34% vacancy and 52% retail shop vacancy. Uh, and just to highlight the likes of um, there's proliferation of uh, takeaways on the street and some late night activities, casinos and uh, properties like that. Uh, so we have identified certainly for Dublin Street the need for local authority intervention and what we might call active land management, where the I suppose the local authority itself becomes the, the agent for change. And if we go beyond the typical, you know, what a planning authority does prepared the development plan with a more proactive regeneration focus area, uh, maybe area specific regeneration plans with a focus on funding the likes of the URDF, the Town Village Renewal Scheme and the Historic uh, Towns Initiative. And also to make effective use of other legislation, the likes of the, the Derelict Sites Act and uh, you know, even to go as far as the compulsory acquisition of property as well. And what we have done in Monaghan is for Dublin Street, we have prepared regeneration plans going back to 2017 for the Dublin Street South area and for uh, Dublin Street North uh, plan adopted uh, uh, just last year. And for these two plan areas, the URDF funding is has been approved to deliver uh, the necessary infrastructure and that is that uh, currently at detailed design stage for both of them. And so I suppose what we're trying to achieve and deliver is the you know the quality town centre living where you look to reimagine the backlands, uh, create new streets and places to live and um, look at how we reuse and adapt buildings within, within the street itself. Um, and we're looking to make it attractive as for multi-generational homes that people actually would like decide to choose to live in such an area um, and be inclusive with uh, public squares and have cultural identity, opportunities for amenity and relaxation, uh, the connectivity and permeability with the rest of the town centre in between the streets and to ensure the historic evolution of the street and the town centre itself. So I suppose um, how we went about selecting the properties, uh, Dublin Street is some of the properties are in ACA and with a number of protective structures on the street. Uh, we did an individual owner consultation workshop um, before we submitted the application to the HTA um, and we got good positive feedback and I suppose that the properties were certainly chosen based on the interest from the, the owners and also had in regard to say terrace development and the overall you know visual impact that the project could make. Um, and how the 
can contribute towards the active use of the properties. Um, so I suppose we looked, uh, we selected eight properties in total along two terraces. The first image there on the left is uh, has five properties in it. And the second image there on the right, it has three properties in it. Um, so our, I suppose, our project does relate to delivering on the Dublin Street regeneration plans through the reuse, reuse and adaptation and thereby contributing to the overall plan delivery. And so the, what we want to achieve through the building facade enhancements is uh, eight properties, say over two terraces. And we set about to, with a tender for the conservation architect uh, to consult with the, the owners to define the scope of works, uh, procurement of and the supervision of the works. So there's um, just the typical individual elements within the facade enhancements, the, you know, the declutter of services and the fixing signage, et cetera. Uh, either timber timber window repairs and replacements uh, depend on the state of the, the you know the of the timber itself and also to replace some of the aluminium or aluminium or uh, pl plastic windows as well and to replace the uh, guttering with cast iron or to repair the existing cast iron gutterings and then just to carry out some I suppose. Uh, repairs to the to the rendered surfaces and painting works. And this is, um, I suppose, an example of the detail of the drawing prepared um, to go to tender for the procurement of the contractors as well. So it details, you know, all the exact works that have to be done for each of the, the properties. And then I suppose to review where we are with the for building facade enhancement at this stage, um, we have tendered for and appointed uh, the conservation architect to consult the owners, uh, the scope, the procure and the supervision of works. They were appointed in May. Um, and then the conservation work has had the responsibility for consulting the owners and uh, working with the local authority, defining the scope of works and uh, the procurement um, of the and supervision of the of the services as well. Um, and uh, I suppose both a building contractor and when you window manufacturer. Um, so just to note, we received limited tender submissions um, over budget, and some of them were incomplete submissions. Uh, so I suppose there was a clarification required, and also came to a point where we had to seek additional funding from the Heritage Council. Um, and you know, there's the having to review the works and the budgets, um, and looking for additional match funding requirement with the owners. So this, you can imagine all the process and dealing with the different sets of, you know, the consultants and the contractors and the owners, um, and that all takes time. So we did then get additional funding approved um, at the end of October, um, and we have secured the upfront match funding by the property owners uh, just there at the end of December. And we're currently at the appointment of uh, contractors when this is uh, hopefully due to commence very shortly um, with works uh, starting on site. And just as both, it has been um, a lot of owners to engage with and also with their family members. And it's come to the stage now where we're proceeding with five of the eight prof uh, properties, three have withdrawn. Uh, unfortunately, one of the owners passed away. Uh, second property, there's a uh, title over issues over the legal title and the third owner um, has decided to concentrate on funds on other elements of repair to the property including uh, the roof so as there's a positivity certainly in that one where it is encouraging works um, on the property even though they don't want to avail of this scheme and um, so I suppose you know this has involved this uh, project element has involved dealing with a range of professionals consultants contractors and procurements and match funding um, and I suppose it has been an achievement and a result of building trust that we have managed to secure the, you know the match funding element uh, from the from the owners and um, have that money uh, up front and before we commence any works on the on site.
And then on to the internal works um, to properties numbers 24 and 50. Uh, I suppose what was involved here was individual tenders for each of the property again, um, procuring conservation architect for the preliminary detailed design uh, drawings, the, looking at the planning, the fire safety and disability access certs and the, the consultants they were appointed in June. Um, and the consultants then had to prepare site surveys, uh, consult with and uh, get an agreement with the owners on specific requirements. Um, and the preliminary drawings have been completed there in October and now they're being assessed but for the, by an engineer with expertise in fire safety and disability access. Uh, there's a requirement for some small opening up investigative works at the minute too, just so that's just the, the current stage we're at, at that with that element of the project. Um, and I suppose what's left on that is to agree the drawings with the owners um, and with the local authorities, planning officer and the fire officers. And so that uh, planning application was required for number 50, that that will be submitted later on this month. And then we'll follow on uh, to achieve the, the certification for the fire and disability access. Um, I suppose what then after that, with uh, conservation architect, will need to specify the building works and tender for the for the works also. Um, and the focus of the works themselves will be on achieving the you know the requirements from the fire safety and the disability access. And we've uh, had to, I suppose, to ensure that the objective of getting residential back into these properties um, will conditions that any of the, the works when complete that they will have to within uh, three months of completion to be the properties that are available for and subject of inspection for private rented letting or that they're owner occupied. And just this is um, number 24, Sherry's pub, uh, the protective structure for the internal works and this as you can see from the drawing there that might not be that clear but suppose some of the the facade enhancements were the repair of the, the timber sash windows and um, repair of the, the gutters and shop front and remove the, the clutter from the front of the building and um, to do some small pointing and painting works as well to the property. And this is um, just showing you the internal alterations proposed. It might not be that clear, but I suppose we can just uh, go through them and what will be delivered at the, you know, the, the pub at the ground level, it's in current use. Um, so this is at first and second floor proposed works to, to reinstate the front entrance to the pub as well, which will ensure the separation of access from the, the residential element at first and second floor levels. Uh, the window, new window to the first floor living room and new balcony open space as well. Um, and also to incorporate an ensuite. And I suppose we can say that these are modest enough changes that make uh, certainly a more attractive contemporary place to live with in the town centre. So that's, you know, some significant works and that those, I suppose it requires a lot of detail with fire safety and the conservation expertise, the disability uh, access as well. So there's a lot of stages involved in getting to what is, you know, modest enough works, which makes a big difference to how this property can be used. And, and then on to number 50, um, this is within uh, ACA area, um, and this was a proposed facade enhancements to this property includes new windows at the upper levels and repairs uh, to the shop window, the door and the, and the access gate, and replace the cast iron gutters. Um, and just the internal works and let's hope to that we achieve uh, one dwelling unit over the uh, the vacant retail unit and deliver a three bed um, three bed residential plus home office incorporated within that too. So some of the works involved here internally include the one hour fire rating to the stairwell enclosure and that will provide the separation between the ground floor retail from the residential uh, and some of then structural openings to form uh, the form a larger uh, living and dining space and amendments to doorways um, and back to also to the bathroom and shower areas as well. 
Uh, so again, modest enough changes, um, uh, but certainly to create um, a quality town centre living space. And then I suppose what are the project learnings from the, the internal works element? Um, and I suppose the objective of this uh, element was to understand and address the issues to and the barriers to owners in bringing properties back into residential use. Um, and I suppose we need to be able to understand the level of the owner's vested interests. You know, there can be emotional attachment um, and this can, can result in a very positive contribution to the street. And also, you know, consider that against the, the financial um, consideration also. And we might look at both of those properties and think, you know, could we've got more than one residential unit each in them? Um, but I suppose, again, it maybe reflects uh, the vested interest of the owners and the pride they have in their properties and that, you know, the desire to achieve a good quality standard uh, that is more, maybe more important than the profits to them. Um, and it also, I suppose, again, shows what can be achieved on a, on a modest enough budget without doing major extension and renovation works uh, to the property itself overall. Um, I think we'll, there's, you know, we can note some issues around the, the confidence of the property owner and we also have family members involved too. Uh, there's a lot of variables to consider, a lot of steps in the process. Uh, with all the range of professionals and contractors and services. So it can be, you know, quite daunting for uh, these property owners that certainly wouldn't have a background in property development. Um, and we also need to suppose, look at the understanding and appreciation of the process and the level of technical services and that we need, I suppose, to be able to, to document this uh, process clearly in a step-by-step -step process in plain English so that the learnings from the Lexus process can be um, available to any other owner that wants to consider um, doing some modest works and renovations to their properties. We we'll need to make it as, I suppose, as easy for them as we can. Um, I suppose also then what became apparent early in this, uh, after we received the grant funding was the, the impact of price inflation on the confidence of the owner. Um, and that, you know, was, I suppose quite daunting for the owners when they saw the price of what we had estimated um, originally and then with the, the war and um, it just seemed to just uh, prices rocket so that certainly had an impact on on the property owners and the viability of the project. Um, I suppose then in terms of having a protective structure to deal with and that's the additional complexity uh, where we want to consider the whole structure and the, the cartilage of the property also, um, the requirement for planning permission, and also the need to respect and uh, conserve the architectural features of the property. And I suppose certainly for this property number, Sherry's Pub, um, I can say that we were certainly working with an owner who has uh, previously carried out some sensitive repairs to the main structure and also some works previously on buildings within the cartilage at the rear of the property. Um, and there all is, certainly is potential for ongoing refurbishment with the whole property itself. Um, and, you know, ongoing continuous reuse and adaptation of this protective structure. So that, you know, there's always potential and all these um, additional works that can, can be done with such a, a substantial protective structure, which, you know, there is, we need to consider how we might support the likes of these property owners going forward as well. Um, just picked up on a statement um, at the launch of the Town Centre First Plan by Minister Humphreys and that a one-size-fits-all approach will not deliver the outcomes we want uh, for our towns. Um, I suppose threw up a few questions there. Can more be done to support the, the longer-term owners? to refurbish properties. And I've mentioned in the presentation that the vested interests that um, the owners of these properties have, you know, they're, they've maybe lived in the properties, there's some family value, and, you know, they they're certainly want to continue to protect and contribute to the, to this, to the activity on the street as well. Um, and again, what is the greater good benefit to supporting these owners? And again, I've mentioned earlier that, you know, the that they're probably best placed, the owners with the vested interest are maybe best placed to have that, um, the want and desire to 
protect the heritage asset of the property and contribute to the street also. And just a few points there. Generally, rural town buildings, um, the likes of Dublin Street, have very little formality, maybe beyond the, the facades. Um, there, well, there's possibly, you know, the more individualism than you would have in cities, um, probably all individually built rather than, say, like a developer coming in and building a, a block of uh, developments. Um, and this certainly does prevent challenges in defining solutions for these properties. Um, just note certainly with the smaller local authorities, with the absence of the likes of key expertise of a conservation officer or an architect, we do rely on procuring and also certainly the, the availability of a range of professionals, which does, I suppose, hold us back from getting on with doing a lot of uh, good work that could we can see needs to be done. Certainly in County Monaghan, you have five rural towns of um, all very good architectural and high quality. Um, and then we also look then at the protective structure versus the non-protective structure, structure. And, you know, is there different levels of supports required to owners uh, for internal works? And maybe to consider um, is can we have better coordination in the funding supports and linkages between schemes and, and you know, with it, uh, whereas the likes of the scheme might be linked to having additional top ups under the, the uh, built heritage and investment scheme. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, ongoing supports are needed for such properties, which maybe gives more confidence to owners to, you know, carry on and do works and enhance these properties also. And then finally, I suppose what we're talking about delivering on town centres first and, uh, you know, go back to the programme for government, um, the implementation of a strategic approach to regeneration by utilising buildings and unused lands um, to promote the residential occupancy. Um, and I suppose what this project is certainly to contribute to the reduced vacancy and to enhance the attractiveness of the street to contribute to the Dublin Street Regeneration Scheme uh, and resulting in improved town centre vitality and viability, and then to build confidence at the both the individual level and the overall town centre. So thank you. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, very interesting presentation there. This was the first project we did spread over two years. And I, if I'm not mistaken, you're going on site with the works, I think it's February more, is it? Yes, I hope so, yes. Um, so it's for the very reasons and challenges that you set out, it's been a difficult one in terms of procurement and cost inflation and people just, some people withdrawing as well. So it's very much a work in progress. And the reason we were keen on showing this presentation was just to show the complexity of these. And in terms of it's more complicated when you're refurbing or doing conservation works to the interior of a building. Um, anything you wanted to add, Shirley? Um, yeah, well, thanks uh, more for delivering the presentations. Um, yes, Ian, um, I think, um, more is highlighted there at the end, the lessons learned through the project. And I think the complexity is one of the things that we need to bear in mind. And also that, you know, the Historic Towns Initiative is, is more than just about bringing people back into, into towns. It's about retaining the historic fabric of towns whilst, whilst, um, and whilst helping people to live in, in a town centre. So it's not the same as, you know, perhaps, you know, knocking down, um, a few a terrace and rebuilding new and building them to a very high BER standard. So we're trying to encourage people um, to live in an historic place and to benefit from their historic fabric. And I think there's a lot more complexity in that than even delivering a standard, you know, um, conservation project where maybe you're looking at something on its own with its own cartilage when you're looking at a terrace and you're relying on your neighbours and all of that. So it's very complicated. And um, particularly in small local authorities, as Maura said, we have five towns and we have an, an, an equal number of villages, if not more, over the 400 um, residents re, or number of residents or residents that would be that would the town centre first policy applies to. 
And, you know, we have a very small team in the local authority and we don't have any architectural um, staff or conservation officer on board whilst we're trying to avail of these very good schemes. Um, so it would be good for smaller local authorities, I think, not to be campaigning, but to have, you know, supports for more staff, for more um, professional staff to help us deliver um, on these very important projects and even to link maybe in more with the sustainable towns, the decarbonised zones and the active travel networks as well. Yeah, thanks, Shirley. Um, noted and, and agreed. Now, there are some questions coming in. Um, thanks, Raymond, for answering the questions about the McCroom project in terms of cost and ownership. Now, Mara and Shirley, two questions. Was there any private amenity space provided for the refurbished residential properties in Monaghan? Yeah, for the Sherry's pub, the protective structure, there's a provision for balcony space at the first floor level. And also, you know, there is existing rear garden space as well. And for the, the other property, number 50, uh, there's an extensive rear garden there. So, you know, the private amenity space is very well catered for. And then what is the agreement with the landowners after the property has been redeveloped? Can they rent the property to the private market thereafter? Or what is the agreement with the local authority? Yeah, it's to be available, either owner occupied or available for private rented and subject to inspection as well. And we're looking to that the owners within three months of the of the works um, granted under this scheme that they would be available for rented. Thank you. Um, so we've no op other open questions. Um, if you have a question, its, it's system seems to work better if you use the Q&A facility rather than the chat. So I think that makes more sense in terms of uh, interaction. Um, so we're now at a, a short screen break time. So grab a cup of coffee, have a stretch, um, and we'll come back at 11 o'clock where we'll hear from Catherine McLaughlin about a heritage-led regeneration plan in Wexford Town. But before we do that, just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, Mary, Raymond, Moira, Shirley, Mairead, um, Fanula, and the Minister for all your words, for your questions, interaction. And see you at 11 o'clock and we'll, we'll go again until lunchtime. So thank you very much. Um, we'll pick off again and we have a range of interesting presentations now uh, from Wexford to Tipperary Town to Nace to Buddy Shannon and then just a little bit on the workings of the scheme for 2023. Um, so our first presentation after that short break is Catherine McLaughlin from Wexford County Council. Catherine's the Heritage Officer and I see her there, good. Um, so Catherine's going to talk about the Wexford Town Heritage Z Regeneration Plan. This was the first year last year, 2022, that we introduced a Heritage Z Regeneration Plan facility and Catherine got hers across the line. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Catherine. Thanks, Ian. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Thanks, yeah. Catherine. Um, so yes, I'm the Heritage Officer in Wexford County Council. And uh, last year we applied for a Wexford Heritage-led regeneration plan through um, the new scheme that was offered um, through the Historic Towns Initiative. Um, so the focus of our project was to examine the existing heritage of Wexford Town and determine what conservation focused interventions could be undertaken to improve the historic town centre. It was an objective of our plan to develop an action plan with clear objectives for heritage led regeneration and the resulting plan um, is to be used to inform uh, future grant applications. So the process um, really following the announcement of the, the, the grant funding that we were successful in getting a grant from the Heritage Council a workshop was held about the plans in uh, the Heritage Council itself in Kilkenny to really talk about uh, those plans and I suppose what the expectations were around those. Um, following that process, um, I, we designed a brief and this was tendered through the e-tenders process. 
And following that, we appointed our consultants who are urban scale interventions, and they have undertaken this plan uh, for us. So the process for us involved uh, fieldwork, research, public engagement, co-design workshops, and interviews with key stakeholders. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, lovely Wexford is located in the sunny southeast, and it's our county town. Um, has a population of about um, 20,000 and has a lovely uh, maritime location on the side of the, the Slaney estuary. And from the outside of the project, um, it was very important to define the study area for the plan. So um, those of you who, who might know Wexford, you know, you can tell it's really very much defined by the town walls. And here on the, the, the graphic on the right hand side, you can see the town wall is defined by that red line. And that really defines that historic spine of Wexford. And it's an area which includes the town walls, Selskar Abbey and Westgate, North and South Main Street and the Quays. And we also included the former Wexford Jail, which is outside the town wall at the north, and that was included in the project. Um, so Wexford essentially is just to give a bit of historical context. It's a wall town um, with origins dating back to the Hiberno Norse uh, Viking uh, period. The town walls that we see uh, are very much a product of the Anglo-Norman expansion of the town in the centuries following 1169. And there's very good surviving lengths of those walls throughout the town and a mixture of public and private ownership. Several stretches of the wall have been the subject of previous conservation works through the Irish Wall Towns Network grant over the last 10 years. And the historic core of the town is really much a reflection of its Hiberno-Norse and Anglo-Norman origins. And as I said there, uh, Wexford is part of the Irish Wall Towns Network, so we can avail of that grant aid. Uh, modern Wexford is really well known for its uh, cultural and arts associations and the Wexford Opera Festival is one of the major international opera festivals and our art centre is one of the longest established art centres in Ireland. <coughs> now the population of Wexford County as a whole has increased um, quite significantly uh, as evidenced by the recent census results and the commercial vacancy rate in the town is slightly lower than the national average um, at 12.3% compared to 13.9%. Now we have a number of existing plans, local plans and policies in County Wexford, which would reflect you know, heritage and conservation. So we have the Wexford County Development Plan, the Wexford Tourism Strategy, uh, the Wexford Local Economic and Community Plan, and of course the um, Wexford Town Walls Conservation Plan. And uh, forthcoming, there will be the uh, Wexford Town local area plan. A big part of our project was public engagement um, and a questionnaire was developed by the consultants which was shared publicly across uh, the County Council's uh, network on social media and website. There were over 300 responses from the public which is really quite phenomenal um, and key stakeholder groups such as Fosh Ireland, the Heritage Council, Visit Wexford, Wexford Chamber, the Tidy Towns, uh, the Arts Centre and the Historical Society were also interviewed as key stakeholders as, as part of this process. Um, some of the questions, I'm just going to, to show you just a couple of uh, questions and results from the public engagement process. So here is some of the main reasons that people have for visiting Wexford Town. And um, you'll see at the top there, it's a cultural heritage experience. Um, shopping features very strongly for Wexford. Um, meeting people, you know, food and drink, just hanging out um, type reasons. But when we go to the next section, which shows uh, the top three priorities for Wexford Town, improving heritage sites and spaces uh, came out very strongly in that response, um, along with uh, creating jobs and employment, safer streets, uh, tackling climate change, um, bringing nature back into the town. You know, there's a real wide range um, of responses from the public engagement process. And some of those key messages uh, you can see here, um, plenty of heritage assets that need to be utilised, um, open the graveyards. There's a very strong sense of community and civic pride in Wexford. Um, a lack of accessible green spaces. And you know that's quite interesting in terms of what uh, Maria was saying earlier about, um, you know, 
people living in town centres and, and lack of amenities and green spaces for people. And that has come out quite strongly in, in this public consultation process as well. Um, here's just some photographs from our co-design cool workshops with the consultants. And these workshops, uh, along with the interviews with the key identified stakeholders, um, really um, formed, you know, fed into the resultant plan, um, along with the field work and research which was undertaken. Um, so to the plan itself, oops, here we go. Um, this is the, the, the cover of the plan by USI. So it's, it's really a what was, what is and what if um, scenario for Wexford. And the plan is grouped into four chapters. You can see here we have an overview of, of what we've done, uh, what was for Wexford, what is currently uh, for Wexford, which is really defining issues and opportunities and, and what if with a, a vision and action plan for the future of Wexford Town. Along with um, the other processes, asset mapping was a very important part of understanding the town and, and what we have. So the plan contains a series of maps on the following themes. Uh, we have existing heritage protections detailing, you know, the architectural conservation areas, protected structures and archaeological sites. Um, then there's heritage and cultural assets, nature and public spaces, connections and amenities. And a vision, of course, for heritage led regeneration uh, of Wexford Town. And again, this is this has been broken down into several themes that you can see here, the heritage and cultural assets, nature and public spaces, connections, amenities, stories and events. So the action plan um, was obviously a really big, a really big part of of this work, um, because that is where um, you know, the, the, the actions that we can work on are going to are coming from. So the action plan is divided into a series of sections with short, medium and long term actions. Uh, suggested partners, next steps, resources required and potential funding streams have been identified. And the funding streams identified are both small scale and large scale. So, you know, you have Irish World Towns Network, Historic Towns Initiative, Historic Structures Fund, the Urban Regeneration and Development Fund, and Fosha Ireland initiatives, etc. And there'll be other, you know, community grants and other kind of um, grant funding that um, could be availed of as well. Um, this slide just shows one of the pages from the plan from the connection section uh, showing a what if scenario. So what if we created a linear urban park and walkway alongside the town wall circuit, which is something that we have been um, working on in Wexford over a number of years with the Irish World Towns Network grants and something we would continue hopefully to completion. Um, again, this is just a, um, a some information from the action plan from the connections section showing um, uh, issues such as the laneways, you know, town-wide um, issues and again talking about the town wall um, so that action plan is, is you know, quite developed. It's, 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 it's buildings, it's nature spaces, it's heritage, conservation. There's, there's a, a lot of information um, in that action plan. So uh, the next steps for us um, is the incorporation of the actions of this plan into our forthcoming uh, local area plan for Wexford Town. And then obviously to start securing funding for the projects which are in the plan. And some of those projects are going to be um, quite quick, short term actions um, that will improve immunity um, in the short term. But some are obviously quite longer term aims, looking at larger settings of buildings and areas which would require uh, quite a lot of funding input. And so I just want to end just by talking about the positive outcomes of this, this process. Uh, really, it, it has been a great um, collaborative process with the stakeholders that were identified, but also um, new stakeholders and new audiences have been engaged through the public consultation process, um, which is fantastic. And obviously the plan itself, we have now have the production of a clear action plan for future heritage led regeneration actions in Wexford with funding streams identified, which we can begin to work on. And also, um, I see that there has been an increase in positivity regarding the role of heritage-led regeneration actions 
to improve the town um, for both local people and visitors. And that has been um, really just nice to see that, you know, people are in engaged in this process. There's been a lot of activity, you know, going back again to what Maria has said, talking about, you know, communities being involved um, in these processes for their towns. And to see that as part of this process, you know, has been has been fantastic. Um, so that's just a glimpse of our plan and how we did it. And um, I hope that's been helpful for people who might be thinking about doing it this year. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I hope we'll see that plan cited in a lot of funding applications. Absolutely will be. Guaranteed, Ian. Starting very soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, Catherine. Now, there was one more of a comment than anything, and it was about your slides. Could we move them to full presenter view? We tried that yesterday, and whatever was going on with Microsoft and Zoom, it just stubbornly would not do that for us. So, yes, yeah, so apologies for that. If people couldn't maybe see the information properly, um, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, but we'll, we'll have those presentations and slides up shortly on um, the Heritage Council YouTube channel. So we will people will get a second bite at all of this. Um, now, I don't see any other questions, but you'll stay with us, uh, Catherine, and if anything pops up, we'll, we'll come back on it. Um, now, the next presentation um, is, there's a slight change to the programme. We're still going to stay with Tipperary Town and the project in the Love Factory. Roisin O'Grady, Heritage Officer with Tipperary County Council, will start off, but she will be assisted ably by Chris Southgate from Southgate and Associates Engineers. And uh, they will give us a very good account of this uh, heritage conservation project in Tipperary Town. So I'm now going to hand you over to Roisin and Chris. Are you there? Yep. Good oh, morning. Far away. Great. Um, I'm just, I'm going to just share a little slide here just while I'm talking, <laughs> just for a few minutes. Um, I won't take up too much of your time because, as I said, Chris is going to um, give the overview um, of the project itself. But just, I suppose, a bit of context, uh, Tipperary is a historic uh, 19th century market town uh, located in the south uh, western part of our county. It is our, it is our name town um, for the county, of course. Um, it has earlier origins, but the streetscape itself is predominantly uh, 19th century buildings with really intricate, lovely decorative work and um, some really wonderful um, shop fronts. In common with many towns, Tipperary faces challenges due to town centre vacancy, traffic, dereliction, etc. And in 2019, the Tipperary Town Revitalisation Task Force was set up to uh, address the many issues that have impacted on the development of, of the town itself. The task force is made up of 18 members from a variety of sectors, community voluntary, local authority, public, private, and uh, it meets monthly and is supplemented by several working groups. And one of the very active groups is the Heritage Subgroup. So it works to deliver projects in the areas of enterprise, social inclusion, education, public realm and the environment. And one of its early initiatives um, when it was set up was participation in the Collaborative Town Centre Health Tech Health Check Programme, which is of course run by Ali Harvey from the Heritage Council. And Ali has been working with groups there for the last number of years. And the Tipperary Report was published in 2022. And it showed a very high level of retail vacancy um, uh, rate of 31.2% um, in the town centre. So when I circulated the guidelines um, to the districts last year, which is the usual process in the council, uh, the Tipperary MD came back with the um, task force project manager um, with a proposal on the glove factory building, uh, which had been brought by a developer and it was being repurposed for accommodation and with a commercial unit um, at the bottom. Now, I was kind of interested, I suppose, because I knew the glove factory. It had been vacant for 50 years a very attractive building. Uh, people in the town have a huge affinity with it. The gloving industry was very strong in Tipperary. Uh, it was kind of active from the 1900s to the 1970s. Uh, so a lot of people have connections with it. They have no people that worked in it, their relatives and, and friends. Um, and I suppose there was a huge cottage industry associated like that in which the women of the town did piecework. Uh, so I suppose it was a very important element of the industrial heritage of the town. 
town. Um, I had supported the local heritage centre to do an exhibition and a publication in 2018, which was hugely popular in the town. And they had also done a radio documentary in 2018. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the HTI this year, it was the first time that we'd actually done um, a third party application. Usually anything we do is kind of county council projects. So of course, that's a little bit different. Um, and I suppose I was a little bit nervous maybe at the start. Um, there was two key points, I suppose, with the documentation that I received about the project. The first one was planning was already in place. Um, having done the HTI before, time is very tight, so you don't really have time to be kind of dealing with, with, with planning um, once you start the project. Um, and secondly, the conservation team was also in place. So Southgate and Associates were on board. Um, having worked with Chris and his team uh, over the last number of years in a number of projects, I knew their expertise and their experience in relation to heritage-led regeneration, and I knew the quality of their work. So I suppose that kind of made it a viable proposal for us. Um, grants to a third party, just for anyone that's going down that road, I suppose are slightly different in that it wasn't really a council project. So um, it, there's a little bit more administration, I suppose, in terms of working with the developer in terms of compliance and things like that and kind of the acceptance of the grant. Um, you know, th th there was a bit more work to do, but uh, Donica, to be fair to him, um, was very enthusiastic, was delighted to receive the grant of 163,000. Uh, so the conditions and everything associated with that, the refund clause, all of that was was really no problem. Uh, I suppose the one tricky thing was that in terms of the financials and the drawdown, we couldn't have uh, an invoice from the development um, company themselves. So I suppose we had to go down a lower level and deal with sort of project invoices. Um, so in November, you can imagine in the middle of the grant season when you're dealing with 75 to 80 invoices, uh, it did kind of strike the fear of God into me, but I will say God bless Anne in Abercorn uh, uh, um, Accounts Department because she was absolutely fantastic to deal with. Um, I got a really clear and transparent set of accounts that were related to the project. Um, and I think maybe, I don't know, will Amanda agree with me um, in the Heritage Council, but I think the, the process itself of the drawdown and the sort of the reporting uh, was relatively pain free, even though we had an awful lot of documentation. Um, the project itself, from the council's point of view, which was hugely successful. Um, the grant itself was a game changer. Donica would uh, say that, I suppose, um, with the funding, um, it allowed decisions to be made um, on a conservation basis as opposed to a commercial or economic basis um, for, 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 the, for the developer himself. Um, so what we've ended up with is the bringing back to life of a really significant building on a street in Tipperary Town. It has really uplifted that street um, in the town um, and it has got an awful lot of very positive um, public response. Um, so it, it has been a very positive outcome for us. Now, um, Chris is going to talk about the the actual the, the logistics of it. But just before um, I go, I just wanted to say one quick aside. During Heritage Week, um, I supported the premiere of a film that was made locally. The Tipperary Heritage Group, as I said, are very active. They had got funding from the Heritage Council this year to do a project with Museum of Childhood um, on the ACA in Tipperary Town. Part of that was um, a film on the glove factories. Um, and there is a core group of people there, Dr. Desmond and Mary Alice O'Connor and Caleb Barrett, um, who have done a number of films over the last couple of years. And basically what they did was they looked at the history of the glove factory and gloving in the town. Um, and they also included a little drama piece about a day in the life of the glove factory in Tipperary. And that was produced and written and acted by, by local people. So I just have the uh, detail there. It's available on the town revitalization uh, website. So if you get a chance, have a look at it. It's a lovely piece of social and industrial heritage in the town. And I'd now like to hand over to Chris who will talk about the actual project itself. Thank you. Hello everybody. My name is Chris Southgate, um, heritage um, conservation specialist, heritage engineer, and um, we, we were the um, consultants involved in the scheme. 
I want to thank Roshina Grady for her amazing support for the project, you know, dealing with the administration, the grant drawdowns and everything. It's just wonderful to have a local authority that's that puts out a helpful hand. And I cannot un underestimate um, the advantage of that. Um, before I run through the project, I'd like to say a few general words about the Historic Town Centre an initiative and heritage-led regeneration. Uh, the minister said, um, this is not just about building projects, it's providing a sense of place, character and time depth. And you can see from this project that that is absolutely the case. It almost seems that the actual building work is only 5% of, of the effect of a project like this. It unlocks a sort of subconscious connection, not only to a sustainable historic urban landscape where heritage led conservation can lead not to a sort of fossilized and dead sense of history, but a dynamic town or city for the future. And I appreciate Marie Aids Hunt comment that each, each town is different. However, it also produces social and cultural integration, a sense of place and identity rooted in the past. So a historic center provides a symbolic connection with the subconscious of the past at a human scale, which is comforting and welcoming to future residents and also to tourists and the new emerging communities that Ireland is so um, successfully welcoming at the moment at a time of slight um, reorganization in, in, in the world with immigration, etc. In Tipperary, people have stopped me in the street to comment. They haven't commented just on the building, they've commented on their sense of pride of place. And this has, seems to have unlocked um, th that sense um, in Tipperary. So I hope that it has a greater influence than the building itself. We notice, um, just before I, get, I, I go onto the slideshow, some accidental effects of historic led regeneration. During COVID, there was accidental public realm where restaurants spewed out onto the streets of, of towns and cities. There's also a, a sense that accidental successful business uses of historic premises that developers sometimes have a negative view to, to um, historic conservation, believing it as a kind of a, a, a punishment almost. And yet, you know, in Cork City, I found that actually it's the historic buildings that have actually actualized the area and created um, regeneration. Deliberate successful business uses for historic restoration have resulted in many other um, um, businesses copying. And certainly, um, uh, you, you know, that, that, that we, we've had um, an unusual response to heritage-led regeneration. There's also a sense almost of having to support super diverse communities in Cork City Centre. And we feel that there's a huge opportunity as, as they regenerate uh, and as they occupy the historic centre. Our communities are changing rapidly and heritage provides opportunities for the future. So now I'm going to talk about the glove factory and I'm just going to share my screen now hoping it works. Um, here we go. I'm going on to the slideshow, which won't, wait a minute, just, yes, it will show. Can you see that? Yes, you can. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Okay. So here we are at the glove factory on James's Street in Tipperary. Um, our client, Abicorn Construction, bought the property to develop it into apartments on the first and second floor. And initially there was talk of residential on the ground floor. And I think I helped to persuade away from that and go for commercial because mixed use is, is an important aspect of, of, of regeneration. Um, so it's going to be living over commercial. The building was in need of full refurbishment and conservation. We, there was a multidisciplinary team engaged to design and supervise the project with various um, specialist contractors undertaking the works. And that was quite important because um, what we realized is that the building 
was um, plastered originally, but that had been designed for exposed stone originally. So we needed expert masonry um, uh, contractor um, Ahern Brothers. The grant, the, the Heritage Council, as Roisin said, gave 163,000, which made a huge difference to the attitude towards um, the conservation, particularly of the exterior envelope, which is so critical. Uh, we focused on the external envelope and windows and elements of structural consolidation to the external walls um, with fit out and, and finish of the apartments are going to happen in the future. But this was the first important step. Without the funding, the conservation works may not have been able to have been form such an integral part of the scheme. We would have had to make compromises. Making the financially viable refurbishment of a historic building balance with sensitive conservation is difficult. And Abercorn Construction's approach gave a good case study for building uh, schemes of similar nature, which would benefit from historic town center initiatives in the future. So there's a, there's a learning experience here. Um, which, which I hope filters through to other projects. The building is located on a street um, that was um, dated uh, James Street, 1839 to 41. It operated as various commercial businesses with over-the-shop accommodation. In the 1930s, it became known as, as, as Roisin said, as the glove factory with many local memories. 20 Jane Street is a protected structure and it's on the RPS. It's also recorded in the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. It was in a terrible condition, declining, uh, 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 as Roisin had said, it had been left for 50 years and need of full conservation works. Now I'm just going to proceed. Um, the main works undertaken with the HTI funding was the repointing of the exterior envelopes, careful remover of the failed render, which was a cement render, which was locking in moisture, uh, repair and resetting windows and sills and heads by a conservation joiner. And the most important aspect was there had been some horrible repairs to the window heads, which had used precast concrete lintels. And we got an expert masonry contractor to rebuild the window heads in conservation brickwork. So we conserved the sash windows. We put in certain new steel floor support structures to help the existing timber and cast iron structure do its job for the future residential. And we repaired um, and retained the cast iron columns, as I said before, and also the conservation of the Bresima beams was an important aspect. We were able to slot in steels between the timbers. So we were in a lucky position. It's not always easy to deal with failed Bresima beams on a historic building, but there were gaps between three timbers which allowed steels to be inserted. Then we uh, um, carried out careful removal and reinstatement of a chimney, um, which, which is retained to maintain the important character of the streetscape. So let's have a look. Here was the exterior envelope um, before the grant funded works. And then we're looking at some of the works internally. You see the um, temporary support there, the existing timber steel, uh, it, 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 the main beams supported on cast iron columns as the central spine. And you're also seeing um, new joists pairing and, and strengthening the original joist structure. Um, to the right, we can see that the, the roof structure was actually replaced before we, um, before our client bought the building. The exterior envelope was absolutely an amazing feat of masonry conservation. Um, if, if you can remember before on, on the previous structure, we'd seen precast concrete heads, but we, with carefully selected bricks, we were able to re reinstate the arched, um, camber arched, um, brickwork heads, we were able to carefully repoint um, the existing masonry structure. And I cannot underestimate how important that is in terms of creating a dry structure and, you know, deeply pointing into gaps um, 
where 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 the moisture where the uh, moisture has has caused the, the mortar to fail and then you can also see the reinstatement of the um the relieving arches over the bresimer beams and one of the interesting things about this um project which isn't completed yet was that actually looking at paint scrapes on the windows the we, we were able to date the window frames at ground floor level um to the same date as the sash windows above so we were we're in the process of just finalizing that window refurbishment at the moment but again there is a building here having been restored which smiles at you as you go up J james's street and and regenerates a sense of the past and and um and activates um a, a subconscious memory as i said before here's some of the detail of the pointing work and and um we can also see um to the left there the cast iron columns retained the importance of the glo um, glove factory um I i'll just run through this briefly now um just one minute while i find my notes um it's a heritage-led regeneration it's a resource for dynamic towns as i said with critical accommodation and commercial opportunities the project is an example of a developer-led sensitive conservation and economically viable redevelopment of a landmark town center historic building careful retention and presentation of a historic building while offering much needed modern accommodation in a town center location as a mixed-use building the glove factory will contribute to invigorating a declining main street in Tipperary town acting as a draw for people from other areas of the town it is hoped that this scheme will encourage building owners with similar proposals in historic towns to undertake them the conservation of the glove factory shows how centuries-old infrastructure can be reinvigorated and made financially viable with the help of historic uh, town center initiative funding largely larger grants help to make developers and building owners alike see the e economic viability of conserving and developing historic town center buildings which otherwise may be in decline these buildings hold not only the integral part of the significance and character of our historic town centers but also hold much needed accommodation and retail possibilities which are in demand all over the country urban heritage needs evolution not revolution so examine the extent to which the present situation can be utopian and possibility of introducing visions for the future rather than superimposing them that's paul Mers in urban heritage and intervention in heritage as an asset for inner city development uh, the guidebook 2014. lastly i want to say one thing is that when you look at the money spent uh, 163,000 in grant aid this money was not spent on imported goods from Europe. This was mainly spent on labor, which contributes to a local economy. And the government get back, um, you know, um, taxes on, on, on labor expenses, and it regenerates money into the local economy. Very little money is spent on materials, on a conservation um, project like this I mean the and what materials are used are totally sustainable so I just want to leave you with that point as to what good value this grant funding is to the economy and to society in general thank you very much thank you Chris thank you Roshin for that very practical introduction to the building but also some very interesting thoughts on conservation and heritage-led regeneration, particularly taken by our last slide as well, that urban heritage needs evolution, not revolution. Um, we'll, we'll reflect upon that as well. Um, just, I, I don't see any question in this particular presentation just yet, but if I may, Roisin, have we any kind of a time frame for the residential reuse or completion of that? Um, well, work is continuing. Um, I suppose the grant is, is um, 
it, it, what the grant actually meant was, I suppose, there was a lot more time given to the conservation envelope of the building and actually, I suppose, a considerable amount of money was spent on that element. I think there was probably over 300,000 spent on the first phase of the project. Um, and as the Dunica himself would say, you know, that what that happened because the grant um, funding was available. Um, so I think if they hadn't received the grant funding, we probably they would be at completion stage in terms of, of the kit out of the apartments, etc. But that is is going to go into it to this year and it'll, you know, at, at some stage at the end of the year, I haven't an exact date or anything like that, but um, that will be completed. Um, but as I said, you know, as Chris pointed out, the, that funding really did kind of enhance the conservation element of the project. I mean, Dunnock was very aware of the building. He was very aware of the heritage. Uh, before they cleared the building out, I went in with a number of local people. We walked through the building. Anything that wasn't been used for salvage um, if to, be, to be put back into the building, um, they were allowed to take uh, artefacts and objects, of which there was a lot. I mean, there was an awful lot of material as well relating to the gloving industry. There was an awful lot of documentary um, evidence there as well. I mean, it, it was kind of eerie when you went into it at first. First, um, I think, Chris, you'll agree that you, it, it was like as if people just actually stood up and walked out and left everything behind them. Uh, so it was, there was a very kind of surreal kind of sense inside there. Um, the material has gone to our county museum and to our county archives. But the plan is that when there is a facility in the town that can host these um, artefacts and documents, that they will be brought back to Tipperary Town, which is where they belong. Um, and as I said, there was an awful lot of resalvaging of doors, windows, uh, skirting boards, floorboards uh, and everything. So the commercial element of it is going to be really interesting because it will give people, local people, an opportunity to go in to the building and, and to see the, in, in, as I said, the exterior is really, really popular at the moment and everyone is very positive towards it. But it's always nice to have an opportunity to go into a building that has been done. So the commercial element of that is going to give them that opportunity. But at some stage this year, it will be completed. Brilliant, thanks. Um, it, Can I jump in there, Ian? It looks really well. Uh, Colin, yes. Yeah, uh, just an observation about uh, the processes. Um, uh, and beginning with our first talk this morning from Maraid and the focus on um, uh, re-inhabiting our towns. Uh, what we do with this funding, um, as Chris has pointed out carefully, is where the building interacts with the public realm, the mm -hmm. facades and the exterior envelope. We're spending money on that. And I think you did mention um, a few internal supports to make sure the roof didn't fall down, et cetera, as yeah. well, Chris. Yeah. Um, but that's a, 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 there's a solid case to be made for um, public funding for these aspects of the building, the facades and the roofs and so on, because they're um, accessible to the public. They're part of the public realm. They create our streetscapes and so on. Um, the second thing that they do is that they're uh, improving. They're not going to perfect uh, necessarily in one project, but they're improving um, what we might call the residential amenity of towns. They make towns look pretty. They make them look needed, used, beautiful, um, repaired and maintained. And that is part of the process of building confidence in towns as places where people can live. Um, I'm reflecting on our work with Church Lane in Letterkenny in County Donegal through the Historic Towns Initiative Scheme, where it has taken several years for the buildings that we funded the repair of um, to become inhabited. It's not a quick process, it's a slow process, but what we're doing with this public funding is to build confidence in our towns that they are places where people can and should live and will enjoy living. It will be beautiful to live in and will slowly answer all of the problems about lifestyle and um, enjoyment of life that are necessary. So I think we need to be careful about those step-by-step -step pieces uh, when we look at our aims of revitalizing our town. Absolutely concur with that. Uh, and centres column and it's is very, some of the early steps in that process. It's very much uh, a sense of a historic urban landscape regeneration where everything is connected. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's what's good about this thing is that we always used to look, I always used to admittedly look at buildings as discrete entities, 
you know, here's my project, get that done, move on to the next one in a different town. But this, this thinking is allowing us to look at the connectedness of spaces and, and the effect on society and communities and making places, you know, dynamic for people to live in and, and creating a market for living in the center of a city or a town. Now we've, we've, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Colin. We've two questions for you. One is very open-ended. One is very precise. We'll, let's start with the precise one. Um, congratulations, Chris and Roisin. Excellent project. Was injected cavity lime grouting used in the strengthening of the external masonry? No. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing about it is we, we, we have um, on occasion had to use um, lime grouting injection methods and in fact the last project that this contractor did we had a very important project like that where the joints were so thin that there was no mortar in the joints and it would have leaked like a sieve without but um in this case deep pointing and and compaction was the order of the day the the joints were were wide enough there hadn't been that level of of deterioration of the bedding mortars to require that uh, we have a comment as well from Tom Cassidy. You agree ho wholly with Colin's point the public realm is our citizen stakeholding, uh, even if the project holder is a developer. Uh, now, the open ended question think about this. Can Chris or Roisin share an important lesson learned from this? Well, I, I, I suppose um, it's reinforcing. For me, um, the value of doing good practice works, the value of the grant money in terms of regenerating a sense of pride in place and also sustaining labor and, uh, and, uh, and investing into the local ec economy. I think that from a technical point of view, um, I, I was quite familiar with the project and quite confident about what I was to do technically. It's more the social effect of it that it's, it makes me feel extraordinary. That, that, that It's almost as if there's a subconscious effect that we don't really measure, you, you know, when, when, when we're talking about this, particularly myself as a consultant. I think it's all about how well I did the pointing, but it isn't. It actually is unlocking a sense of, of of memory in the past, a bit like your ancestors. You know, you 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 know, you you're actually uh, you're actually regenerating something which is which is more than just the building. Okay, Good, great answer, Roshi. Um, well, I suppose one thing that that kind of stood out for me towards the end of the project was the impact of it. Um, the because of the the high level of of vacancy in the town centre. Um, the municipal district held a workshop for property owners in October and Chris spoke at that and Donica was at, in attendance as well. And uh, I suppose what, what that did was it, it maybe kind of took some of the fear out of the whole process of engaging with historic buildings. Um, there was over 60 people from the town that, uh, that were property owners at the seminar. Um, we had our um, fire officer there as well, who was kind of talking through the, the, the sort of the requirements um, there. And it was a very kind of a positive um, seminar. Um, and a lot of people, I think, you know, took away from that and with the evidence of 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 the the glove factory i think there's there's a big interest now in the buildings in the town um donica is also doing a property on the main street which is quite a prominent property and again has a kind of a long historic association with people in the town so when people see things like this happening and when they can have access to the information uh when they can hear that people were able to get grant assistance for conservation elements of of the project it does kind of build momentum so we're hoping that this is going to be a very positive outcome for what is a very real problem in the town um so I suppose that was kind of one of the big learning things for me that, you know, sometimes, as Chris said, you think of one building and you're doing a project in one building. But the broader impact of that, I think, has been quite astounding in this instance. Yeah. And also just to say the can do aspect is important. You know, it gives confidence. 
and and part of that confidence is to have the funding in place but also to have a that support of rasheen you know within the local authority a sort of a can do attitude to yes you know we'll help you through <laughs> with your project and that that that's a huge a huge advantage i think you know okay um Roisin, Chris, thank you so much for telling us thank about you. that fantastic project. It's brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, um, where are we off to next? We have a lovely project to hear about. Um, Ruth, are you with us? There you are. How Hi, are you? Ian. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, our, so our next speaker is about the potato market in Nace, County Kildare. We have Ruth Kidney, the ACO in Kildare County Council. So over to you, Ruth. Thanks, I'll just share my screen here. Okay, so thank you for, um, for inviting me to speak on this project. Um, it was a fantastic project to be involved with. And I think um, having my presentation at this time um, in the morning is very fitting um, following Chris and Roisin's presentation, as this project is not only focused on, on reinforcing the built fabric of a historic town, but also reinstating an ancient practice of town centre market trading. So um, the project we named Resurrecting Nace Potato Market. So just to give you a quick, a quick introduction to myself and um, how the project came about, um, I am Architectural Conservation Officer at Kildare County Council and I'm recently appointed, um, so it was December 2021 when I started in this post, and the heritage or the uh, HCI application was shortly after that, so it was a steep learning curve at the start of this, um, a very enjoyable one. So I will move on through our, sorry it's not moving here. Here we go. So um, I was asked by our senior planner um, in January to look at doing an application for the HTI and we pulled together um, an internal team to find a suitable project. So there was myself, Bridget Lachlan, the Heritage Officer, and Robert Burton, who is one of our planners. And together we, um, we went on the search for a suitable project. So um, the, the HDI aims we had looked at carefully were the heritage-led regeneration, residential vacancy and dereliction in town centres, reuse of historic structures and interpretation um, of this was uh, we needed a catalyst for change. We need something that could prompt a residents to, to um, want to live in these towns, um, not only by restoring the built fabric, but looking at the public realm. So um, like many of Ireland's historic towns, um, Kildare had a high level of, of residential vacancy. Um, we have the historic building stock essentially. Now the question is how do we make it attractive for the residents? Um, so many of the towns are car dominated and lack community open space. Um, so it's an opportunity to strengthen community and create opportunities to bring people together in the in-between spaces um, and enhance that sense of place that we are all familiar with. Um, so it's not only enhancing tangible uh, heritage assets, but also the intangible. I think Kildare um, Market Square is a perfect example, which um, Mairead Hunt had, had briefly mentioned in her presentation earlier. It's a great example of how public realm um, and design for the community can regenerate a town and create a unique sense of space, a sense of place, I should say. So um, we examined a number of, of, of towns and um, we came back to NACE in, in County Kildare. Um, so we looked at our opportunities in this town to reuse um, derelict town centre sites um, to open public spaces in the heart of NACE, which it, it does lack, and to promote town centre living. Um, so um, just to give a, bit, a brief history of NACE, um, it's an ancient, an ancient town. Um, it's historically significant. It was for almost seven centuries, the seat of the Kings of Leinster. Um, it was an early Christian set settlement and a medieval walled town. So it has, it has a lot, but which isn't quite apparent as you, as you drive through it, because that's, it's, it's mainly now, um, it's, you know, it's a busy, a busy main street. Um, the, the history isn't, isn't that ancient history isn't apparent. So it's something we were keen to enhance. Um, so NACE being the newest member of the Walled Towns Network, um, there's no remnants of the walls visible today, um, but there is much historic built fabric. So that became our starting point. Um, we need to understand and appreciate this, this history. 
Um, so nestled in behind the market square on Main Street accessed off Church Lane. So you'll see the red dot there on your screen is the potato market. Um, it is in a very old part of the town, as you can see in the image to the right there. Um, it's adjacent to St. David's Church, um, which is built on the grounds of, um, of the early Christian settlement and St. David's Castle which um, is a 16th century castle built um, form, built on the grounds of a former cast 12th century castle. So um, the area is, is really unique, but you'd hardly know it's there. Um, I'll just go back to the last image where you can see the red, the red arrow points to the potato market. Um, the first image is from Market Square in the center of the town. The red arrow is pointing towards St. David's Church. So that's a tower that's um, it's 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 um, it's in a poor state of repair that's on the boundary of the potato market. Second image there are the entrance gates, which which are orientated toward the market square, um, which is was almost forgotten by the locals. It was it was locked up and uh, no one was really aware it was there. They didn't know what was behind those gates. So our intention was to open those gates and give it back to the community. So just to give you more on the context, so this is the, the, the medieval context, um, St. David's Church, as I'd mentioned, um, the, you can see there on the first edition OS map, um, you can see St. David's Castle to the right and the potato market, and then Church Lane is another thing important to remember that that links the three sites together. So that is the lane that is to the south and to the um, east of the, of, of the, the, the buildings. Um, and that was also an important, um, th that is a, 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 um, a lane way with rubble stone walls and it is, it is a very unique character and again it's, it's, it's not a really integrated into the town centre, it is, um, it's currently in, used by cars as a, as a short, um, a shortcut into the market square which is very unfortunate. Um, so it's a really unique location. Um, we were very lucky to have something, you know, um, in the centre of town that could be easily transformed into what we what we um, turned it into. So you'll just see the next slide now is the St. David's Castle, St. David's Church and Church Lane to just give you an idea of the, the, the buildings that we have in the vicinity that were just almost forgotten from the centre of Nace. You wouldn't you wouldn't know they were there. Um, so just to put it into context, then um, in terms of planning, um, there was the local area plan, which had highlighted this area as um, public realm project or project pro public realm intervention. Um, and the potato market was noted with some routes through the site, which could integrate the, the grounds of the church and the castle. So essentially what we call the castle quarter could be enhanced. Um, so also it is part of um, NACE conserva architectural conservation area um, which covers this, this the vicinity of this, of this site. Um, so we had our site, um, our aims were to, sorry, I lost the presentation there. Sorry, yeah, our aims are to restore the derelict site, enhance medieval NACE, um, reinstate community use, market use into a town centre site, which would we'd see or hope to be a catalyst for regeneration and also relocate the Nace Farmers Market, which had recently been moved out of the town into um, the town centre again. And that was that was really a great achievement in, in this project, I think, because we, 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 we got the market, the stallholders back into the centre where they should be and where they originally would have been. So then um, just down to the site itself, uh, the routes through that I'd mentioned on um, that were included on the LAP, um, this is what we found when we were on site. We, um, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were, they weren't very visible. We knew they were there, but there was a lot of debris on the site. So route one is from the potato market into the grounds of St. St. David's church. Um, route two is from, to the, to the east in through, um, the grounds of St. David's church. It's another, another, um, 19th century building called Sexton's house. Um, which then brings you around into the church. So it, these routes are key to opening up this area. Once the potato market was open, you could essentially, um, you could walk straight through from the potato market into St. David's church grounds and potentially into the castle then. Um, and just to mention as well, the castle is currently under restoration. So it's, there's, there's no use as of now, but it, um, in the future we see there, there will be, there, that will be brought back into use. So this, this whole area will be linked together, hopefully. Um, 
so yes, the, 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 the site was quite overgrown, as you can see from the images here. Um, there, was, uh, there was a lot to be cleared. Um, um, so next slide. This is just to put the history um, of the market in. There was a market in Nace, um, I think uh, as early as the 12th century, there's records of a market being in Nace. Um, and then that moved throughout the town to the Fair Green and then out to Market House later on in the 19th century. So, um, but it, um, I, a very interesting just piece of evidence given to the State Affairs and Markets Commission, which was published in 1855. It was noted that there was a potato market in Ace since time immemorial. And just to clarify, the potato market would have been would have been fruit and veg market, um, essentially away from the livestock market, which would have been held on Market Square um, at some point. So it was uh, the cleaner foods. Um, so this is the site, um, St. David's Church Tower behind. A lot of people confuse it as the castle, but it's actually the church tower, which was built in 1780. It was never completed. It, 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 it itself needs a lot of work. And that um, became more evident as we went through this project, because uh, when you see the, the, the later images, um, it, it, really does, it really does show how, how much work it needs. Um, it, the potato market, the second image is how its relationship to Market Square, how it faces out to Market Square and then Church Lane to the right. So this is the, the um, little medieval lane that um, winds around the, 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 the castle quarter. So here's some images of the site. Um, again, just the, the, the situation we had. There was asbestos roofing in figure 18 there um, that had to be removed from the site. Behind figure 18 is where route one is. So it was almost hidden completely from view. You could barely see the arch, the um, historic arch that was in that location. And the sycamore trees had had um, had rooted themselves in, within the walls, um, which were causing a huge problem. And also up against the boundary wall of uh, St. David's Church, which is a national monument as well, um, something that I sh should mention. So figure 19 is um, St. David's Church Tower. Then figure 20 is a view towards Sexton's house, which is also derelict. Um, figure 21 is the beautiful lean-to, um, which we had discussed removing, but it was decided that it, we, we would keep it to see how it would work. And then in the future, we could look at doing something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, um, which turned out to be a, a really good, um, a really good approach because it's, we now we had a structure, we reused it, and now we know what works on the site and what we've kind of potential of what we can do in, in an area and a covered area in an open space like this is, is, is very important, obviously, in, in, um, in Ireland. So our concept being a usable community market space, um, the site, which was completely locked up, hidden away from the town and the realization this is the nice farmers market um, on the completed site. Um, so you can see that, you know, it, it was it, it was it's been a great success. Um, the I mean, partly because the nice farmers market was already established and it just it re, it, we moved them back into into nice. Um, so everyone was keen to see them so there every Saturday now so that the site is open on Saturdays with the, the farmers market and we're looking at other uses that over time. Um, so just something, some more on the on the actual budget and how this worked, the actual application. So we were granted um, 168 from the Historic Towns Initiative. So the that was initially on the project, but due to overruns and, and additional items um, that increased. And uh, the final budget was uh, 272,000. And 217 from the, the Heritage Council. So, yeah, some things don't go to plan. And, you know, we did, there, there did things did go over, um, unfortunately, but uh, we got we got a great end product. So um, as the project progressed as well, in terms of, of, of what works we could include in the HDI, um, it became apparent that we needed a part eight for things like signage and um, new gates, some, some items that unfortunately they, did, they, do, they do need the, the necessary permissions in place. So we decided to phase it. Um, phase one would be a conservation aspect under the HDI and phase two would be various other elements that required a part eight. Um, so phase one was site clearance, conservation of the historic walls, reinstating access through the walls, um, new ground for surface, uh, existing upgrade of a lean-to and toilet and temporary lighting. So it's to get the market up and running, see how the site is used, create that community space within the heart, and then 
phase two, which will be a part eight, it's been worked on at the moment. Um, that will include roofing um, some of uh, the outbuildings um, joining the, the potato market for storage, a permanent lighting solution, removal of electricity cables, new shelter, um, possibly the, the, I mean, the one that's there is working very well, I have to say, um, new accessible toilets, kitchenette, um, so, and, perm and, and signage as well. So some important things are coming in the next phase. So the design team for the projects, myself, um, Colin Cosgrove is an um, architect in the public realm and um, conservation architect, Michael O'Boyle, um, grade one architect. So it was essential to have um, a grade one conservation architect in this, in this instance. Um, it was so, you know, so close to a national monument in an ACA. Um, so one of the conditions on the HDI was to actually was to survey the walls for any medieval artifacts, um, which we didn't uncover, but it was important to have someone who was knew exactly what they were doing on the site. Um, construction team then was Talas and Co. Um, and they, we, we had to go for public tender, um, which I mean, I would say for future applicants, it's just so time consuming that it has to be considered in um, at the early stages of a project. So creation of tender documents and then and then a public tender. So um, this is when the, the fun and games began. Um, Talus started on site. It was it was September, start of September by the time they got on site with an eight week program. Um, the walls, there's just an image of the walls. The sycamore trees had rooted deep within the walls um, covered in vegetation. So after initial site clearance, you can see the extent of ivy growth of um, sycamores very, very close to the historic walls, which we, we had anticipated might be a problem. Um, Church Lane, once we got, once we removed the vegetation from there, the, the, the wall bending, the, the, the public road um, appeared to have a significant bulge. So a, a, another issue and unforeseen that came along. Um, and then you can see from this point, you can see the, 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 the space we had, which was about 700 square meters. Uh, and then the lean to as well, which brought its own set of, of problems. We needed to um, involve a uh, structural engineer to, to just confirm it was safe. Um, so we got uh, Lisa Eden to do some reinforcement works um, later in the project. So here are the sycamore trees. So we, we didn't, at, at the time this photo was taken, we thought we'd actually have to keep the sycamore trees because um, it was felt that they might undermine the walls. Um, so we had planted, or we had planned and designed um, planters to go around them, which wouldn't have been ideal, um, but it, it would have been, an, we, we thought at the time it was a necessary solution to um, this problem. Thankfully, the, the trees, the roots came out with no damage to the wall whatsoever. So we got, a, there was one root that was, that, that couldn't come out and that was just by the entrance and you, it's not even visible, it's behind the, the main gate. Um, the extent of the sycamores you can see here is growing out of the top of the wall, um, which was, it was somewhat picturesque, but not ideal. It was very unsafe, um, but unfortunately it meant that we had to dismantle a lot of the walls. On the third image there, you'll see, um, we had to dismantle this entire section of the wall. Um, and where, that was where the arch, that's where roof one is, um, where the arch into St. David's um, church is. So it had to be rebuilt. The other major issue was the unstable wall um, onto Church Lane. So you can see here the bulge on the wall. Um, this became apparent once the ivy was removed. So this required um, to be rebuilt or dismantled and rebuilt. Um, and I mean, of course, road opening licenses, all these things, they add time um, to the project. So just some of these things we had to consider. So here's some views on on site, a view from scaffolding from St. David's Church down into the potato market facing towards the lean to. So route two is just in between Sexton's house, which is to the left and the contemporary lean to. So it's just a little door, a door, an existing doorway, um, which had to be at the, the head of had to be replaced, but otherwise that it was, it was fine. Second is the rebuilding, this is a route one where it'd be rebuilding the arch into St. David's Church. Um, on the left hand side there, um, it was a very interesting find was a set of, of steps um, leading to what looked like a loft level on one of the outbuildings. So I have a, 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 a photo of them later in the presentation. Um, 
we removed the asbestos roof that I had referred to, which would have been where the scaffolding is on the second image. And we decided we, at that point we couldn't do anything else with that. It's on the boundary wall of uh, our on national monument. And there will be a plan in the future possibly to do something there, but um, we would require to do necessary permissions. So um, then just some more on-site pictures, giving you an idea of the extent of work um, that was required on these walls and then once the the second image there is where the um where they're starting to lay the ground cover so this is phase one complete um so the restored gates the new ground surface so that will allow community use and and market use um you'll see there's a small planter around the edge of the walls which we intend for planting and uplighting the walls in the second in the second phase the rebuilt wall, wall um, onto Church Lane is the third image. These are the routes through, um, so this is route one, through to the first image is straight through to St. David's Church Grounds. There's a, a change in level there that, again, we needed, um, we will require part eight um, to, to fully complete it. Um, this is the arch which leads to that space. That was rebuilt. That was where the sycamore tree was growing out of the wall. Had to be completely rebuilt. And the third image there is the the two the two um, the two openings. Then route two into Sexton houses. Um, it's it, uh, again it was closed for the moment. We close it at the moment for until the next the next um, phase where we, we we would look at having a gate in that location. A gate in both locations so there is some level of security between the sites um, which has to be considered as well so this is the lean to um which was uh, it was a delightful surprise at the end that it could be it, it could be turned into something quite exciting um we got an artist a visual artist called cage um in to do this amazing artwork it was absolutely fantastic and it really it just it just brought life to the whole the whole project um then just some um, festoon lighting. This little, in the second image, that's the existing toilet, which was in a fairly poor state of affairs. We just clad it in timber to, as a temporary measure um, prior to the next phase of the project where we'll have accessible toilets. And then um, the last image is demonstrating some of the furniture we got in the savage yard around, around there was a savage yard around the corner, um, which was kind of quite fitting with the, the medieval kind of theme of the area. Um, so, yeah, they ends up. It ends. It's it's permanent seating. You can't, you can't budget, so it was quite. It, it worked quite well. These are the, the the stone steps that were uncovered throughout the works, which were quite interesting because they we we didn't know what they were for a while till we got all the vegetation off them, and then it turned out that there had been a gardening center um, who had been who had been set up in that area, and they had turned these steps into a water feature. So um, it's quite unusual. Now we still we haven't done anything to these steps. We have left them as they are, and we'll have to do, come up with a plan in future just to keep it safe because they're they're one point five meters at one side, so there's a safety issue. But um, a plan will be formulated in the next phase as well for what we do with that. Um, there's some outbuildings that were attached to the um, the northwest side of the potato market, which will be roofed in the next phase and um, will will be necessary storage for market traders. Um, and this is the sorry, this is market day. Um, some more artwork from Cade there on the old on the old um, lean to. Um, so it's this is the market trading. It was it has been very successful. I think. Um, yeah, it 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 really. I think you really see the 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 St David's Church Tower really stands out. Has been you know really requiring work now, but uh, the the market really potato market really came together. So just to give you an idea of opening up the gates to Nace Market Square, Central Nace, um, and people utilizing this um, covered sheltered area, which is is very important in the market space. It's just more pictures of it at night. I mean, we, we would see that this space would be used by the community, community for various elements where we'd be planning um, maybe a temporary stage or a permanent stage that the local theatre group could use um, and uh, various other, maybe even a, a permanent fixture in the market so that it can be used during the day um, safely. And there's a security aspect to it that has to be considered. For now, it's open on Saturdays for with this market, but we do see it as op to, to be opened a lot more. The timeline um, for 
this is something that uh yeah it was it was quite stressful to to keep it within time i think it just con considering the amount of tendering that needs to be done for um within local power local authorities and uh and getting all the documentation together um, the anticipated timeline included in the in the in the um, application was to open for heritage week but unfortunately we were behind that so um, we we opened on the 26th of november so they were the works were just completed in time um, mainly the tender process delays things and then some unforeseen on site that i mentioned they also contributed to the timeline so thank you very much that's um that's the presentation for the data market Thank you, Ruth. Um, it looks like NACE has got a marvellous new public space and it'd be great to see how that develops and how it's used over the next number of years. So well done. Thank you. Um, now I see we have a question. Oh, we have two questions. First one is, have you retained the original gates? Yes, we have, yeah. Really? Now the, the, the gates were, um, I, I think they were 19th century. So the, yeah, or there wasn't a huge, the late 19th century there wasn't a huge heritage value, I think, um, in the gates, but we we felt it was right to to um, to keep them. And then, can I ask what material was used on the ground surface? We used ballylusk, and the reason we used uh, ballylusk ballylusk dust um, gravel. Um, the reason we used this was there was no. We took out all the. We had to take all the sycamore trees out, so there was no vegetation left on the site. It was. It's quite stark now. Um, so hence why we thought of the planters, but we wanted to pick a material that was a little bit warmer um, that would pick up on some of the tones in the wall and just a warmer, a warmer um, tone than the limestone. So. Yeah, looks well. So thanks, Ruth. Um, okay, thank you very much. Well done. Now we slipped a little bit behind time, but I know Joe and Colette won't mind too much. Um, because that's our, our next presentation, Bally Shannon in Donegal. And we're joined by Dr. Joe Gallagher, who's the Heritage Officer, and Colette Beatty, who is the Conservation Officer for Donegal County Council. And they're going to tell us about the community led heritage generation in Bally Shannon. Over to you, Chris, or over to you, Colette and Joe. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> thanks very much, Ian. And uh, can you see the presentation there on the screen? We can, yeah. We can, yeah. That's great. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today about our experience in Ballyshannon. Uh, we're looking at our, uh, principally our, our 2022 Ballyshannon Historic Towns Initiative, although we'll give you just a little flavour of our 2021 initiative also in Ballyshannon and look at the community-led and heritage-led approach to that uh, project. Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction to Ballyshannon just to give you a little bit of context and, uh, and also a little bit of uh, information about our 2021 Historic Towns Initiative. And then Colette will give you some advice on getting started with your Historic Towns Initiative and look at an overview of the conservation works that we undertook this year. And then I'll, I'll return then just to talk about a few of the lessons learned. Ballyshannon lays claim to being one of Ireland's uh, oldest towns. Um, the earliest settlements date from 2000 years BC, um, purportedly, and uh, it's based at the mouth of the River Erin. And you can see sort of a, an illustration there of the historic town itself. It was created a, a borough by Royal Charter in 1613. And you can see that magnificent 14 arch bridge uh, there dating from the 17th century, which was later replaced uh, when they built a hydroelectric plant upstream in the 1940s. So there's a single span uh, bridge now there. But Ballyshannon is one of five heritage towns designated by Donegal County Council under the County Development Plan since 2000. It's also a historic town in that uh, it's been designated as such under the Urban Archaeological Survey of County Donegal uh, from the 1980s. <clears throat> There are 67 protected structures in town and 75 structures on the National Infantry of Architectural Heritage. And its archaeological significance is emphasised by the fact that there are 35 archaeological monuments in Ballyshannon or its immediate environs. Ballyshannon is also located along the Wild Atlantic Way, so it's a very important tourist artery into the county. It's a strategic town uh, performing a special economic function as designated under our county development plan, 
related to cultural heritage and enterprise and tourism and archaeological heritage. When we were doing our project, <clears throat> we had to get um, some information in place to provide a basis, I suppose, for the work that we were intending to do. And that really started in earnest, I suppose, in 2019 with the Ballyshannon Design Guide. And then subsequently that was followed by a town centre health check in October 2019 in partnership with Queen's University Belfast. <clears throat> in 2020, we followed that up then with the historic uh, town uh, conservation plan. And that really set out the priorities for the conservation of the historic buildings in the town itself. Now this built on a number of other initiatives as well that we had over the years. Um, back in 2009, we produced a Ballyshannon Heritage Town a Guide, a walking trail. Uh, in 2014, we had our very successful uh, Held in Trust seminar, which looked at the establishment of civic trusts in our towns and villages to try and conserve the, the built heritage in those settlements. And in 2021, there was a draft regeneration strategy and action plan, which is now starting to be put into effect this year. But also we relied on the, the work that was done by the Ballyshannon Regeneration Group and the local historical society. And they did some wonderful work uh, over the years. And you can see one of the panels there for the heritage trail around Ballyshannon that they produced a number of years ago with support from the Heritage Council. Now in 2021, we focused our attention on the Mall in Ballyshannon, and we looked at 13 historic buildings and did work to 13 historic buildings, mainly 18th and 19th century buildings along the Mall, and one uh, historic building on Upper Main Street. And the reason I'm sharing some of these images with you is because uh, last year when we gave our presentation, we didn't have some of the aftershots and I just thought I would share some of those with you just to give you a flavour of the work that we did that year. Here we can see the, the former bakery building shop, <clears throat> quite, a, quite a bad state of repair. <clears throat> but again, some of the fixtures and fittings were still evident inside the building itself. And again, with funding from the Heritage Council and with a little bit of Creative Ireland funding, we put in a meanwhile use <clears throat> and restored the shop front itself. So that now it's a point of interest as people walk along the Mall. We also had the McIntyre Saloon Bar. The bar was downstairs and an accountant's office upstairs. And uh, that, as you can see, had some structural issues there. And also it was in need of some um, external uh, repairs. And with the support from the Historic Towns Initiative in 2021, we resolved those uh, structural issues and reinstated the hand-painted signage. We also did work to the Condon House, which is an early 19th century uh, structure. You can see it here draped in ivy. Uh, the building hadn't been open in about 40 years, so much so that we actually had to break into the building with the owners uh, present uh, in order to see the, the condition. And there was a tremendous amount of work that was required there. So this was be the work before we began and after we had completed with at least the external, external building envelope uh, secured. And you can see sort of the, the sash windows reinstated. Uh, there was quite a substantial amount of structural repairs and roof repairs that were required as well. We also worked on a terrace of buildings along the Mall, uh, one of which was the birthplace of the poet William Allingham. And here you can see the the, work, the buildings before we, we did the work and you can see the, the installation of PVC windows had taken place over time. And we took our inspiration from this, this uh, yellow building to the left, which had still much of its original fabric. And we were able to reinstate the uh, timber sash windows, some with secondary glazing and also the, the timber doors. This is going back to the Bakery building again, and you can see perhaps those of you with good eyesight can faintly see Ballyshannon Bakery Company Limited, the ghost signage on that building, and we wanted to accentuate that. So we worked with a sign writer and we created a new silhouette and reinstated the uh, ghost signage on the building itself. 
So that gives you a flavour, I suppose, of some of the work that we did in 2021. But really today we're here to talk to you about the work that we did in 2022 under our Historic Towns Initiative in the Diamond. And I'll hand you over now to my colleague, Colette Beatty. Colette, you're muted there. Apologies. Thanks, Joe. Um, so this year's scheme, we concentrated our phase two project on the diamond uh, to tackle high levels of vacancy and to boost regeneration. So this historical photograph shows a diamond in the background uh, with the clock tower in the foreground. And this is a main uh, commercial core of Ballyshannon and um, where events were um, held historically. And indeed, the famous Rory Gellher Festival takes place annually at present. So you can see the key buildings that we wanted to regenerate, all in the RPS and NIH, and there was a lot of unused residential accommodation in this area. We wanted to secure all the envelopes of the buildings, repair original features where necessary, and where PVC building, uh, PVC windows sorry, had failed, replaced with historically informed joinery. So we wanted to bring the quality back to the visual appearance of the buildings and bring residential space back into use. We started out with eight buildings and at the application stage, but just after the tender stage, three property owners did pull out. So this does happen for a variety of reasons, and this year they were for both financial and ownership reasons. So with consultation with owners and the Heritage Council, we amended the schedule of works over the remaining five properties, and we were able to carry out more works to a key landmark building, the Clock Tower, which had lain empty for decades and needed extensive work. So we established a partnership team to deliver the project uh, consisting of a grade one conservation architect, two community representatives and three staff members from Donegal County Council. So this photograph is when the delegates from the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and the Heritage Council came to visit us and see the results of the project on the ground. So from the outset, we prioritise works carefully for each building, focusing on high streetscape impact and safeguarding the buildings and bringing new uh, unused residential floor space back into use. We also carefully estimated the costs. So there's no time to spare once you're notified of a successful grant award. Um, so working closely with owners, the Grade 1 conservation architect Duncan McLaren prepared the tender documents and it went straight out to tender um, to as many contractors as possible. And this takes at least six weeks. So alongside this, we prepare a legal agreement. So uh, once the tender submissions are, are analysed and agreed with the owners, uh, we can get both the legal agreement and the building contract signed and get a date firm down for the contractors to start on site. So uh, the conservation architect, um, who you can see in the next photograph, was uh, procured uh, by the community group and the owners enter into building contracts directly with the contractors. So this year, um, scaffolding needed to be planned well in advance of work starting on site. The scaffold uh, for the clock tower was 25 metres high and needed careful design and a scaffold licence and all the necessary insurances in place. So the, the scaffolding was so extensive, um, it was a great opportunity to get all high level work completed. And it's only when you're up close you can see the extent of the work needed. So extra, extra works were needed to be carried out to the bell stock um, as one of the iron straps were so badly corroded on one side um, that it was highly likely that the bell would have fallen to the ground in a short space of time. So health and safety and working from height was a major consideration from the outset this year. Um, you can get an idea of how complex the structure is um, uh, at, at from uh, the last photograph there, the roof was completely reslated, all chimneys repaired and leaded, and the roof lights repaired, and a large roof light needed to be replaced. The matching green slates were sourced well in advance um, of the project starting. And that's in there. Um, the next slide shows the rainwater goods, um, which were all repaired and painted to match the green uh, roof slates and the colour of the stone. The next slide um, shows the crow step verges, uh, which were all pointed, as well as all the elevations of the building. So a lot of the windows were replaced by PVC windows in the past, but any remaining sash windows were all repaired and they came up beautifully. Um, you can see in the next slide, um, all the historic weights were reused. 
and uh, the next slide kind of shows uh, an after photograph um, and is a, the talking point of the town. The building is coming back to its former glory. So you can see that all the PVC windows um, had failed and new windows to match uh, the original windows are nearly ready to be inserted back into the building. The owner intends to put the building back into a single dwelling house in the very near future. Another key landmark building was a chemist with Bacon residential accommodation above. And this is a photograph here. Um, so this is a before photograph and uh, this is an after photograph. So what we've done here, we reinstated a balustrade, which was an important part of the architectural detail and that was lost. Um, and the property was dominated by rhythmic windows. Um, so the aluminium uh, windows had completely failed. And what we did, we replaced them with timber double glazed sash windows um, to match the originals. So this property will be put back into residential use in the very near future and has stunning views over Balashana. And you can see just how well the windows look here um, in this slide. So another uh, landmark, historically significant building um, is a former hardware shop on the Diamond. Um, it had laid empty for almost 15 years. There was water ingress through the roof and chimneys and the windows needed extensive repair. So the next slide shows all this work um, um, has been carried out and a paint scheme applied and has just lift, lifted the visual appearance of the streetscape. So many of the rear windows were broken and are now all completely restored and the owner is about to start restoration on the Burgish Plot boundary walls. So lastly, we uh, included the repair of cast iron railings and walls on one of our projects, our properties in the phase one, uh, Condon House. And we were lucky uh, to work with Bushy Park Ironworks um, and the railings are now in a workshop as I speak and we can't wait to see them reinstated um, in the spring. So I will now hand you back to Joe uh, for the last part of our presentation. Thank you very much, Colette. And uh, I'm just going to talk you through some of the, the processes that we used and some of the lessons that we learned. And uh, one of the key elements is our path to payment. Uh, as Colette said, we worked with a conservation architect and once he certified the works, the invoices were issued by the building contractor to the owners themselves. That then precipitated an on-site visit by Colette as a conservation officer and myself as heritage officer to verify the works. Uh, once we were satisfied, the bills were submitted by the Ballyshan Historic Towns Initiative Residents Association to Donegal County Council, and we were able to release partial grant payment into the Residents Association bank account that Colette mentioned earlier on. That then allowed the Ballyshan Historic Towns Initiative Residents Association to pay the building contractors. And the reason, I suppose, that we chose that path to payment was because we were conscious of the, the cash flow issue that property owners have. And we wanted to minimise the short term financial burden on property owners. Uh, there's a, a letter there just to the left from the Belfast Bank building that Colette showed you earlier from 1899. And it says, Dear Sir, I will lodge £10 on Monday. I had to get a payment for that amount from Charles Moore but missed him on fair day and he will not be home till this evening. But again, I suppose that the issues that, that were there in the, in the uh, 1890s are also there at the present day and that's the issue of cash flow. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible um, for the, the property owners, the private property owners who were investing 30% of their own private funds in the, the cost of the works. So we, we needed to consider carefully how the payments could be made to them so that they wouldn't have to take out bridging loans and so on. And that pathway to payment where there was certification and verification of works <coughs> allowed us to do that. Keeping community engagement was very important as well. And again, this is a work that was done by a private individual um, who was part of our scheme uh, the year before last. And uh, he put in now kind of a meanwhile use, if you will, in one of the properties that he has along the mall. And he shows his uh, photographs of the, the business that used to be on that premises at that site. So again, you know, bringing the, the local community along with you is really, really important as well as part of your project and keeping them informed about progress, as well as obviously them seeing the progress. It's also an opportunity for cross-directorate cooperation. I, as heritage officer, am based 
in the culture division of the uh, Housing, Corporate and Culture Directorate, whereas Colette is based in the Planning and, and Community Development Directorate. Uh, so again, it was an opportunity within the Council for um, that cross-directorate cooperation. The gentleman in between us there actually worked on the clock tower, on the face of the clock tower, 50 years ago, and here he was back now working on some of the fenestration on the, the bank building. Good and regular communication between the project partners throughout the whole uh, project is essential. It's very important to keep them informed, not least of all because there's quite a lot of decisions that have to be made at fairly short notice all along the way. So, you know, uh, it really is important that people are up to date and that decisions can be made quickly. And that takes time to build up that confidence and that trust between the project partners. It's been a while since Tato cheese and onion crisps have been four pence a packet. And uh, I suppose I just put this in to emphasize to the increase in the cost of building materials that we've seen in recent years. Uh, initially with the Brexit and then with the, the COVID pandemic and now most recently I suppose with the war in Ukraine. And also as we know as well there's also difficulty in the availability of contractors at present as well. So there are perhaps some of the challenges that you may face as well. Let mentioned about getting an early start to your project and again that's really important and early engagement with the key stakeholders is very important. If you need cables shrouded for work to historic buildings, it's important to make contact with organizations like the ESB quite early on to, uh, so they can fit you into their, their schedule. And that can take several weeks in some instances. The Historic Towns initiatives are a wonderful opportunity to support the work of traditional craftspeople, like uh, Jerry McGarrigal here, a traditional sign writer who was doing the ghost signage on the Ballyshannon Bakery Company. Of course, none of this work would, would have been possible without the support of the Heritage Council and the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And we're very grateful to the support uh, that they provided to us uh, this year and in the past. It's also great to see that over the past year as well, our work on the Historic Towns Initiative in Remelton in 2020 and in Ballyshannon in 2021 is also now being recognized. Back in June, uh, our Remelton Historic Towns Initiative won the Urban Design Award at the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland Awards and was highly commended in the sustainability category. The Ballyshannon Regeneration Group won the Sustainable Heritage Award at the National Heritage Week Awards for their Heritage Week event, um, Ballyshannon Historic Town, Conversation and Conservation, which is essentially a walking tour of um, the historic towns initiatives in Ballyshannon. Our Remelton Historic Towns Initiative in early November was one of three projects from 70 projects across the British Isles that was shortlisted for the inaugural Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings Heritage Awards in Conway Hall in London. And we're very pleased to travel over uh, to that to showcase our work. And on November 24th, we had a, a very interesting dilemma in that uh, our Remelton Historic Towns Initiative was uh, nominated for the Chambers Ireland Excellence in Local Government Award. And our Ballyshannon Historic Towns Initiative from 2021 was shortlisted for the KPMG Irish Independent Property Industry Excellence Award. Uh, so we had to divide and conquer, and uh, some of us attended the event in the Crown Plaza Hotel in Santry, while the rest of us went to the Convention Centre in Dublin. And lo and behold, we came away with, with both awards. We're very pleased that the work is being recognised in this way. And it also provides an opportunity to communicate the messages, the important messages uh, around conservation um, about the Historic Towns Initiatives. So in some respects, and thanks to the support of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, the next logical step is Historic Towns Initiatives, the movie. And uh, we're doing some filming in Remelton and in Ballyshannon and Letterkenny, our previous Historic Towns Initiatives, just to talk about our experience there and the lessons that we've learned. And when that's complete, which will hopefully be in the next couple of months, uh, we'll make that available um, on a website near you. Thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak with you today and we'll be glad to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Joe and Colette. That was brilliant. Um, I look forward to the movie. <laughs> Um, I, the archaeologist in me is fascinated as to when we can use Plato, Chris Packets, as a means of dating. <laughs> um, I would wonder if anybody can tell us when they cost, down to a year, when they cost 4p. I think it'd be really interesting to guess that. Um, now, have we any questions? No, we haven't. Maybe that's a sign of a really comprehensive presentation which, with great images, so well done. Um, we're a little bit behind time, so I think what we'll do is we'll we'll move on. So thank you so much again, Colette and Joe. That was brilliant. Now I have to figure out how to share a presentation. Um, here we go. Now, can you see that? We can, thanks, Ian. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now in partnership with Amanda Ryan, who will join us shortly, is I'll give you a very rapid overview of the HTI 2023. What I'll do in particular is I'll highlight the changes. There are just a few minor changes this year. And then Amanda will give you a few very practical tips on actually applying. Um, you can see just starting off, there's our Macroom project. There's the, the Bally Shannon one, and there's the potato market in Nice. And um, now, just in terms of a broader context, um, it's really about the strength of local communities and businesses supported by local and national government, um, about improving the quality of life in the town. I think Ruth summed it up pretty well when she talked about projects that have an impact. Um, the scheme has been running since 2018. Um, and to date it supported 27 towns, um, which it, it grows every year and that's really heartening. Um, what are we at? Um, as we learned very much in the discussion about the, the Tipperary Town Project, it's about heritage and regeneration. It's about building, it's about fabric, but it's about society and community as well. And this year, um, we've got a fund of two million again in capital funding available to local authorities. Um, what's it about? Well, now this is a this is a slight change. Um, each local authority may put forward one application per stream. We've got two streams. So one is for capital works, in other words, conservation. The second one is for a plan. And um, if you want to put forward an application for a plan. Great. If you want to put forward an application for a conservation project, that's great too. Your local authority can apply once in either stream. And I'll issue an email to ACOs and heritage officers about that after this workshop. Um, the program is intended to support a small number of towns in 2023, typically about 10 projects a year. Um, Applications will be assessed by the HTI, HTI National Steering Group. Now, who is that? We run this project jointly with the department, the Built Heritage Section. So it's us, it's them, and we always bring in an external person from Folger, Ireland. They always have an interesting perspective on, on towns. They always know something about what's going on in towns as well. And they, that, that group then makes recommendations to the Board of the Heritage Council. Where's the priority? Um, well, I'll come to criteria shortly, the marking scheme. But we like to see things that are plan-led. Does that mean in line with a HTI management plan, a conservation plan, a public realm plan, eligible actions from a town centre health check plan or equivalent? Um, going back to those points we heard about this morning, we expect local authorities will work with a range of partners. Um, what's the evidence of such partners? Letters of support is a really good way. It's a really good start. Um, so it's great to see those included in any application. Funding for each successful town will be in the region of 150 to 250,000, depending on the projects proposed. Um, applications should reflect the scale of the likely funding available and the identified actions should be achievable within the allocated funding timeframe, i.e. 2023. And I'll come to that timeframe shortly. Um, and then we like to see strong public engagement. So it's always good to see something from the Heritage Group. Now, what towns are eligible? Well, 
almost all Irish towns are historic in origin. I, I don't think we've ever said this. We don't feel your town is historic, so it's not eligible. That said, a town seeking to benefit from the HEI KI should possess significant cultural and heritage assets and have a distinctive sense of place. Um, so your town could be a pre-medieval foundation, a medieval town, a plantation town, a plant estate town, and those established around local industries. The one thing we are careful about is urban centres designated special regeneration areas and the Living City Initiative are not eligible to apply. Um, in terms of policy and reuse, um, one of the key policies uh, for the department and indeed for Ireland, because there is a housing crisis, is about bringing uh, housing for all the 2021 policy. So we're very interested in proposals that will bring vacant or underused floor area and historic buildings back into residential use. Grants which specifically address residential reuse by encouraging owners and occupiers to invest in appropriate conservation-led works and repairs and to bring vacant floor area in historic buildings back into residential use may be phased over two years. So in this case, 23 and 24, subject to a maximum award of 250,000. And that's what you saw in the Monaghan Dublin Street proposal for those two properties, number 50 and Sherry's Bar. Um, so talk to us about that if you envisage it going over two years, if you see residential reuse being a really strong feature of this, um, and then we'll set out a letter of, in a letter of offer how it's to be managed over the two years. What we would be looking for is a breakdown of spend across those two years. Um, yeah, I think the, the important line in that middle bullet point is appropriate conservation led works and repairs. So whilst it's about bringing properties and space back into residential use, the Heritage Council doesn't want to be paying for showers, kitchens and internal furnishings. It's conservation led works that we're interested in, obviously. Um, under stream two this year, um, that's the plan function or the plan stream, we will support applications to deliver a heritage led regeneration plan which will examine the existing heritage of a town and determine what conservation focused interventions are required. So that was what you saw in Capture Midlockland's Wexford Town presentation. So we'll offer up to 40,000 per town for a heritage led regeneration plan. That's the same 80-20 match funding. And your local authority can apply for stream one and stream two. Now what works are eligible? Capital works. Heritage led regeneration projects, which are designed and implemented by local authorities. And that's that's a pretty wide category. Um, more specifically, projects that encourage private owners and occupiers to invest in appropriate conservation led works and repairs and to bring vacant floor area in historic buildings back into use. So again, that's speaking to housing for all and the town centre first policy context. Um, projects that address dereliction and vacancy, conservation of landmark buildings, improved maintenance and general improvements to streetscapes, conservation and led public groundworks, which encourage investment for other sources or from other sources. I think that's one of the, the key features of, of heritage dead regeneration. When it works well, um, it leverages funding from other sources and kind of draws out other benefits. Uh, it lifts streets, it lifts places. Um, I think that's a really important point. Um, we're all dealing with climate change, or we will more and more, um, but it's certainly becoming a, a much stronger feature of, of public policy. Um, so we're interested in projects that build resilience in the historic built environment of the town to withstand the effects of climate change. Um, and then you know, the kind of standard thing that you would expect in terms of our heritage scheme, works, proposed works must respect the character and special interest of individual buildings and the heritage of a town. Um, respect statutory requirements for archaeological and architectural heritage. And then we will seek funding, or we will seek information on sustainable proposed future uses for reuse projects. That's really important. Um, so in terms of 2023, um, each local authority is invited to apply in respect of one historic town per stream. Um, now we have this rule of thumb of 1,500 inhabitants per town. Um, where a programme of suitable heritage-led regeneration projects have been identified by the local authority, 
working with a talent partnership team or local steering group. Um, applications should set out the significance of the town, its heritage, policies and objectives for the, the town and county development plan or be it a local, a local area plan either. Um, town's track record to date and heritage led concert regeneration. Um, is there an ACO involved? Is there a heritage officer involved? It's really important. And indeed anybody else in the local authority as well. And then what's the vision for the town I'll set out in any management plan, conservation plan, public ground plan, et cetera. Um, what do we want to see? How those projects to be, that are seeking funding would promote heritage letter generation? What are the partnerships? So show us what letters of support you have, the extent of matching funding and any contribution and kind proposed, and then leadership. Who's responsible for this project? Um, who's going to drive it? Who's going to push it? Who's going to be responsible for it? Now the criteria, and there's some, there's some changes in this this year. Um, so this, this is essentially what we mark it under. So it's a, a hundred point marking. So it's 30 out of 30 for the first bullet. The extent to which private owners and occupiers or community groups will bring and keep vacant or underused floor area and historic buildings in use, particular residential use, and address dereliction and vacancy. Uh, next one then, 20% the track record and heritage dead regeneration. Um, how does it fulfill the aims of the HTI? How will it make a significant contribution to the regeneration of the town? Uh, then 20% the quality of the projects proposed. 15% uh, how it will enable the built environment of the town to stand the effects of climate change. And um, we get some interesting answers to that. Um, it's generally about bringing derelict properties back into use. It's about roofs, it's about gutters. Um, and it's about, I think, a lot of the a lot of projects are starting to think now about that kind of um, critical mass of a town, about concentrating people and residential use, which can lead to the better better use of services, less dependency on on cars, um, and then I suppose the, there's the the obvious point that the reuse of structures means less demolition and less. Um, well, it's better in terms of carbon accounting, frankly. Um, so they're, they're the kind of answers that we, we tend to expect. If you can go further than that and um, elaborate on that, even better. And then finally, um, the president's presence of a vibrant and engaged community would support the implementation of the initiative. Um, this is a little bit of a mouthful, but it's actually really important. Um, it's a deeper Department of Public Expenditure and Reform Circular. And it's about basically, if you give grants, we have to see the full chain of where they go. Um, so essentially, if you're making, if your local authority is making onward grants to building owners, we need to see um, who's getting them, what terms and conditions. Um, in other words, we need to see the individual properties identified and a description, and that was largely the context for what Joe was doing and Colette in terms of Bally Shannon. How will the monies be transferred to individual private building owners? We need to see that chain. Um, proof of payment is also required at drawdown. The Heritage Council provides a template on that. It's essentially a letter that your Director of Service and Director of Finance and your local authority signs at the final drawdown saying, the invoices submitted are in respect of this project and they have been paid. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, nearly there, I think this might be the last slide or second last slide. Applications will only be accepted from local authorities. One application per historic town per stream. Um, so just to reiterate, um, your local authority can put in one application for stream one for conservation works one application for stream two for a heritage and regeneration plan. Applications, and Amanda will talk about this, applications must be made via the Heritage Council online grants management system. We don't take hard copy applications. It all comes in through that online system. Um, there's the deadline, 5 p.m. Thursday, the 2nd of February, 2023. That's not negotiable. The system shuts down at 5 p.m. Uh, for those applications. Uh, if you have any queries, talk to us in the 
uh, as you formulate or if you're if you're thinking about applying um we we can we can help you out there and then finally uh submission for final claims and reporting to heritage council is friday 17th november 2023 um talk to us in the run into that we will work with you um we'll help you we'll help you meet that deadline um and we, we we've always gotten there um yeah there the last of my slides now i'm hoping amanda is there i'm going to stop sharing there she is i'm Hi, going to hand everyone. over to amanda now um i just hopefully i can share it um so good morning everyone or i should say good afternoon uh my presentation is going to be super quick because i know you've had a long morning and actually my first slide uh ian has stole the content so we'll we'll move on quickly uh so basically online system have to submit your application through that uh the deadlines again are listed and we will be hosting further zoom meetings if you are successful in your application throughout the life cycle of the project because you'll be expected to submit interim reports in uh, the summer, the beginning around May and also September uh, and then the final report on the 17th of November. Uh, so just a bit of application advice, can't stress it enough, please read the scheme guidelines. Uh, allow enough time to complete your application. The online system is a live system, so please save as you go along so that you don't lose any information. Uh, on the final day, traffic may slow down the process so as you get documents please upload them you can go in and out of the system save uh, log out log in again so as you get those documents do upload them um i would suggest that you do uh, focus on those five assessment criteria and indeed if you want to upload a separate document addressing those uh, that also would be beneficial uh, make sure that in your budget table on the online application that you demonstrate the minimum 20% cash contribution. This cannot be made up of in-house time by the local authority. This actually has to be a monetary contribution. So be aware, don't make any assumptions. The assessors will be scoring your application on the information that's presented with it at the time of assessment. We can't accept additional information after the time it has to be submitted with the application. So anything you think that is pertinent to the application, do include it. Don't make any assumptions. Um, the application form itself is a template form. So include that additional information as separate uploaded documents. These must be PDF or JPEGs, and they cannot be more than 10 megabytes per document. Do clearly label them uh, so that it's easy for um, uh, assessors to see what the contents are and don't use any symbols. Our system is quite old. It's I think it was developed in 2008 and using symbols uh, in file names does cause uh, problems with um, us opening files at the other end. So just don't use them, just use plain text. Um, when you upload your documents, you will see a warning saying that it's been scanned for a virus check or checked for viruses. So don't panic. You can continue to work away on your application and you can also continue to submit if you want. Uh, don't let that hold you up. And especially on the last day when uh, it's checking uh, viruses, it does slow down. Normally it only takes a few minutes, but on the last day it could be an hour. So don't let that uh, prevent you continuing with your application and indeed submitting it. Uh, just to draw your attention, I don't know, can you see it uh, to the picture here? I, I really like it. It's actually when we talk about community engagement, this was uh, the HTI project in McCroom in Cork. Uh, in 2022 and they held they went great lengths to engage and communicate their project with the local community and for their National Heritage Week event the builder and the conservation architect were available uh, 
uh, during one of the days of National Heritage Week to talk to the public about the sensitive repairs that were being undertaken. And I believe they had, uh, they advertised it on their own website and through Twitter and all social media outlets and also registered the event on our National Heritage Week website. But uh, it's, it's a good exemplar of what can be done. Um, it, examples of additional information. So uh, you conservation the conservation works methodology and its justification. Uh, copies of quotations, you may not have that at this stage, but evidence uh, to support the figures or costs. Uh, copies of any relevant plans, surveys, audits that have been previously undertaken. Uh, evidence of appropriate consultation uh, with local groups. And again, that's where the letters of support come in. So from your local businesses, local community groups, groups. Uh, these are very important and uh, so do gather those together. Uh, evidence of appro appropriate approvals, permissions, etc. And uh, Ian touched on this and this is about where grants are, what we call onward grants, where ye are planning to grant uh, aid private buildings. So not only do you have to show us how you're going to administer it, but also uh, you would need to say how the buildings were selected. So if that was true, a county development plan or with just the, the basis that they weren't just randomly selected because um, either it has to be a planned competitive um, scheme that you're going to administer or else these, these have already been highlighted through a previous report. And I can't stress enough, current clear caption photographs, these are a must and vital for all our schemes. Assessors love photographs and uh, the old saying of photographs are Pictures speak a thousand words, so true. So please make sure you have plenty of those. And a map also would be good uh, to show any designation uh, that's relevant. So just to give you an idea of the, uh, it is a competitive process. So as Ian said, 2 million fund in 2023. And just quickly to look from 2018 to 2022, uh, the number of applications supported or projects supported um, in comparison with the applications received. So um, last year we had additional funding. Some, so some projects were awarded this uh, in the summer. So hence, we have one uh, award there in 2022 of 345,000. Um, just and then just basically, I will say, if you are having trouble with the system or uploading, do contact us straight away. Grants at Heritage Council .ie is the uh, email address. Don't contact us at five past five to say you had trouble at four o'clock. Just get on the phone or uh, onto the e email is probably the quickest way to get hold of us because we will be monitoring that throughout the day in case there is any kind of problem or a, a document won't upload for you. If that does happen, we can upload it before 5 p.m. Just don't leave it to the last minute. So the best of luck in your application. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, some really practical information there. Um, I don't see any more questions and answers. I see Tom Cassidy might have the solution to the four pence potato <laughs> packet of crisps question, um, which is interesting. Um, Can I jump in there, Ian? Go on, Colin, yeah. Yeah, just on the photographs and to reinforce um, the point that Amanda made, uh, for an assessor on the grant scheme, Having the photographs in one place in a PDF document, ideally, um, it gives you the chance to put them in order and put the captions on clearly, as Amanda has stated. Um, it's easier for the assessor to read. And when you put them in order in the PDF, um, someone is scrolling down through that document and seeing things the way you want them presented. And that can be handy and useful. If there are... Um, 30 uh, individual uh, pictures uploaded independently. It's hit and miss whether the assessor will see the ball um, or in the right order or in the right sequence. So uh, doing them in the PDF is more convenient, more compact as a, a piece of, um, what you call it, a megabytes on your 
um, computer and uh, it gives you a little bit more control over how you present the visual information about the place. Joe, did you, I see you coming, Joe, did you want to say something? No? Okay. Um, look, I don't, I don't, I just see a comment from Owen Sullivan just saying thank you, beneficial presentations and so on. Um, I think give us, give us, drop us a line or an email if you have any queries between now and the date. Um, grants at heritagecouncil.ie or idoyle at heritagecouncil.ie. We try answer as quick as we can. It might seem a little bit intimidating or daunting in terms of some of the projects you've seen here if you haven't done one before. We tend to try work with people. I think Finola May said at the start that it's a flexible scheme. If you find you're having serious cost overruns during the course of the project, we'll, we'll work with you on that. And we did reallocate monies over the course of this year as well. Um, so other than that, oh, I do see a question, hang on. Uh, what are the requirements for supporting documents for the stream to plan measure? Do we need quotations for these also? A quotation would be highly beneficial, yes. Um, supporting documents, for the stream two, that's the plan measure. That would be, what's the policy context? Give us a description of the town, set out what the key heritage issues are there. Um, anything else you can think of, Amanda? Um, I would say, and if they can't get a quotation, I suppose maybe again, some kind of evidence for the basis of the cost, that is just not something that was plucked from the air, yeah. uh, would be the main thing that, you know, the assessors can see, okay, this, this is value for money, this, you know, this is a realistic uh, cost. Yeah. So it's now it's gone past one. Um, we've had you busier listening since 9.30, so I think we'll We'll give everybody their, their lunchtime. If you have any more questions or queries, like I said, drop Amanda or myself an email. But finally, just like to say thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to Fanula for your words to start and the minister as well. And thank everybody for their interaction and all their comments. So best of luck at your applications. Thank you very much. Bye bye.